All right, hello world. This is CS50 on Twitch. My name is Colton Ogden, and today we are going to take a break away from Solitaire, which we've been spending two streams on so far, and we're going to dive into a much simpler game, but a game that's fairly new, and a game that some of you might have played, a very famous web-based game called Cookie Clicker. Um, and I'll, I'll pull up a screenshot here in just a second, but thanks so much everybody in the chat who uh, wished me happy birthday before the stream started, so as they started it off and then started a, uh, a trend here. So thanks Asley, Samar, Bavik, um, Whipstreak, and all who uh, wished me a happy birthday. Sarusias, Otanjobi, Omedito gozaimasu, Colton San, which is, uh, I believe that means happy birthday. Uh, I know Omedito means uh, congratulations. Otanjobi, I do believe, is uh, birthday. And Bella Cures, thank you all so much. Appreciate it. Thank you very much for the birthday wishes. 28 today. Uh, two, two years away from the magical 3-0. Um, I'm going to pull over to my screen here, and I, I want to show everybody what Cookie Clicker looks like before we actually get into implementing it. And I, I, to be fair, I actually didn't test to see whether um, we could play this, but it looks like we can. This is Cookie Clicker, so if I click this sort of cookie, you do see that I get a sort of a plus one, uh, I get a cookie animation, um, and I, can, I have a sort of a counter there saying that I have 24 cookies thus far. So your goal is to accumulate cookies. And I think there's a more macro level goal. I think you're trying to take over the world or prevent like a candy invasion or something. So if I keep clicking, you'll see that cookies do get uh, increased. Over here on the right side, and this is where the gameplay, you know, you, so you might be thinking, oh, this is kind of a very simple, boring game. Why even, why even have this game exist? I'm just clicking cookies you know, for the sake of clicking, essentially, on the screen, right? But there's a bit of a, a larger scale, almost business aspect to the game, almost a tycoon aspect to the game, whereby you can purchase these things in the store on the right-hand side here. So I can buy a cursor, and what that'll do, and you can, it's kind of hard to see, but it's actually rotating around the cookie on the, on the top side right here. But what that cursor is doing is now it's actually uh, clicking for me, um, or at least it should be. It's looking like it's very slow, 0.1. Uh, oh, it might be, oh yeah, see, there it is. Yeah, it just added uh, one, I, I, what's the rate on these, by the way? Every 10 seconds. So every 10 seconds, I'll get one more cookie that I don't have to click myself. So you can see that it went to 37 and then to 38 by itself. It should, in a second here, go up to 39, if I'm not mistaken. 39 cookies. So the goal of the game isn't so much to click the cookies you know, indefinitely and sort of waste your time as a human doing this, but rather, well, arguably, but your goal is to amass sort of this empire of cookie generating uh, structures. Things like uh, cursors, things like uh, grandmas, which is the next tier of things that will they'll bake cookies for you. Uh, things like factories and mines and much more. Uh, I did a little bit of research into the game. I, I just bought two more cursors, so now I'll get a few more cookies per per uh, second here, but you can see that you have a per second rate of cookies, which is 0.3, so now I've increased my rate of generation by quite a bit. By clicking, I can keep buying more stuff, up my rate of generation, that's ultimately your goal. Just up your rate of generation, get billions of cookies, and take over the world with your cookie empire. So we'll be doing a version similar to this today, our own version. It's not gonna be web-based, it's gonna be uh, in Love 2D, in Lua, which we've been doing in the past. We could implement this um, as a web-based game, uh, certainly, and that's the, the version that the actual game itself is written in, but we're going to ourselves do the, um, do the framework that we've been using more uh, recently. So uh, I'm just going to read the chat here. I, Elm One was saying, take the day off. I enjoy doing these streams. I wouldn't want to take the day off. Um, and to be honest, I don't do too much for my birthdays. I actually kind of just take it easy and, and um, reflect on uh, having grown a year older, I, I guess. Um, and Bavik was saying that uh, he hadn't been here for quite a while. Actually, I, 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 I do remember, I, I don't think I saw you in the last stream, so yeah, it has felt like it's been quite a while. Um, send 4 eeks says hello. Uh, Nano Machiner, happy birthday, thank you very much. Andre saying happy birthday, True Kines, thank you so much. Omedito uh, Gazaimas says Nano Machiner, appreciate it. Alles Gute zum Geburtstag says Hanjmu999, Donc Zer, Nano Machiner, Omedito Gazaimas. Um, ASMR gaming, happy birthday. ASMR gaming, interesting. Is that uh, is that the um, the sound like the uh, like the sensitive sound or whatever that you hear with the uh, special microphone? Or, uh, I, I, don't, I don't remember offhand if that's ASMR. If I'm thinking of something else, but hello, Lido, happy birthday. Thank you so much. 
um, ASMR gaming. Oh no, Facebook cookies me throughout my entire browser usage everywhere. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, usually, and this is a joke that I made in, uh, I think when I posted on Twitter, was that usually in CS50 we talk about cookies in a different context, so a cookie being a sort of little file that websites can store um, in your browser to keep track of some you know, information to preserve a session or something for a website. Uh, but we're actually today talking literally about cookies that you would bake in an oven or, or whatnot. So it's a bit of an ironic and different change of pace. Um, M. Kloppenberg, good to see you. Um, Let's appreciate how dedicated Colton is. Uh, I mean, this is, I mean, this, we're just making a, a fun game today. This is, this is, this is no sort of exercise in, um, in difficulty here. Uh, M. Kloppenberg saying, actually, I don't know what language that is. I, I apologize. And Van Harte gefeliciteerd, Colton. Uh, I'm, I'm going to assume that probably says happy birthday, but if you can inf uh, let me know what language that actually is, that'd be great. Uh, love all the emojis and whatnot. As it says, no, you have to enjoy your birthday. Don't reflect on becoming older. I, I think that's kind of unavoidable. Garal says, hola, happy birthday. Thank you very much. Lintz, hello. Are these games the same games that you make in your game dev course, says Elm1? Uh, no, it is not. Uh, well, typically not. We, for a lab, we did something similar to Hangman and the typing game that we did in a prior stream, but that's not public online. That was for like a, a summer version of the games course that I teach. This cookie clicker game is not actually a game that we've implemented, neither was Solitaire, neither was uh, Snake or Tic-Tac-Toe even. A lot of the games that we're programming on stream are games that I have never made myself, um, but know how to make conceptually. I understand what needs to go on, and uh, you know, there's only enough time in the day. You can't necessarily have expected to implement every possible game. Um, but you know, doing these are fun exercises for me, and they are a fun teaching moment, I think, for other folks. And Dutch, got it. Oh, Asley, uh, I did catch your message. I know you were the first person to actually uh, to spur the happy birthday messages. So thank you very much for doing that. I appreciate it. Uh, Bavik saying, internet problems, fiber cable broke. I popped in Friday chat to wish, but it got repaired today afternoon. Ooh, that's rough. I'm sorry to hear that. Hope, hopefully that's all solid now and the uh, fiber cable won't break again in a different location. But I, I can't imagine what it would be like to lose my internet access. I would feel lost and confused. So cookie clicker. Let's go ahead and set up a project. So if you're brand new to the stream, if you've never watched a stream before uh, on Twitch, or on, uh, well, if you've never watched a CS50 stream on Twitch, I'm sure you've probably watched a Twitch stream at some point. But if you haven't watched a um, CS50 on Twitch video, typically my videos on here are game development, or uh, game projects that we develop from scratch. Typically what I like to use is Love2D, although we have used Unity as well in the past. But the framework that I like for using, uh, that I like using for teaching game development, particularly 2D game development, um, mostly out of necessity, Love2D is not a 3D framework, um, and therefore we can't use it for 3D development. But the framework that I enjoy using is Love2D, and you can go to love2d.org and download it for your operating system. It's an excellent, lightweight uh, 2D game development framework that uses Lua as its programming language, which if you're not familiar with Lua, Lua is a very sort of popular and ubiquitous uh, programming language used in the context of games, used for game engines all across the, all across the board. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's good stuff. I'm a big fan of it. I use it in my game dev course, and I use it on stream here. It's very easy to get a project up and going quickly and to iterate on it. It feels low level. It feels like, excuse me, it feels like you have a lot of control, even though there is a lot of abstraction for you. And Lua itself as a language is fairly simple and lightweight and very flexible as a result. Um, Feliz Aniversario says Lens Portuguara in Portuguese. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I don't know how to say, I think it's obrigado, which is Portuguese, or thank you in Portuguese. Correct me if I'm mistaken. Um, Thank you all so much for the very kind words. I appreciate it. So if you have Love2D installed, the next step is going to be actually creating a project folder that is going to hold your game's files, your source code files, and your graphics, and your sounds, et cetera, et cetera. And the version, to be clear, the version of Cookie Clicker that we're going to be making today isn't going to be as robust as Cookie Clicker, because we only have a few hours. But we're going to implement the core loop of being able to click the cookie, generate cookies, and then buy things that will let you generate cookies over time, and talk about how we actually get you know, cookies per second implemented and things like that. And um, allow you to use your cookies as currency to buy stuff from the store. So we'll, we'll take a look at all that stuff. And um, see what we can accomplish in just a few hours. Because hopefully we don't want to make this a two or three part stream like Solitaire. We have enough of that going on already. And Solitaire will probably resume either next week or the week after that. So I'm going to go to my streams folder here, which I've set up for all of the streams we've done so far. 
I'm going to create a folder called Cookie Clicker. And then this is just going to be my Lua folder. I can click and drag it over to VS Code, Visual Studio Code. If you're not using a text editor, a modern text editor like VS Code or Atom or Sublime Text, I highly recommend it. You can technically program in a lot of different environments that aren't normally recommended, like Microsoft Word or WordPad or TextEdit. Um, and there are other smaller applications like Notepad++ and Text Wrangler and certain many other programs. You can use Vim. You can use Emacs. I'm a fan of VS Code. It's one of the newer ones. It's got a lot of great plugins, including one that lets you actually run your Love 2D games from the VS Code environment itself using a shortcut, which is super handy. So highly recommend VS Code. But you can use Atom. You can use Sublime. You can use many other different uh, programming environments. So in every Love 2D application, and many folks have seen this already if they've been tuning in, but if you're brand new, you need to make a main.lua, which if you're familiar with CS50 or programming in other languages, main is the sort of starting point of your application. In here, I'm just going to create a, t a comment block at the very top with this particular syntax. I'm going to say cookie clicker, um, you know, the, the typical stuff we do in every stream, just because it feels, you know, it feels official, right? even though this isn't super meaningful. But if people decide to clone this repo, and this will go on GitHub, you at least have my email address. So uh, let's go ahead and write a few functions that are super important. Love.load, love.update, love.draw. These are all functions that Love2D expects to exist in main.lua, and you have to define them yourself. You have to actually tell Lua, uh, Love2D what to do when it sees these functions. For now, I'm just going to say, um, love.graphics.print, hello, or rather, cookie clicker. And then in love.load, I'm going to say love.window.setTitle to cookie clicker. And set title, what that does is it just sets the title bar at the very top of the program. And love.graphics.print will just draw some text to my what will be a black window that we see very shortly. If I hit Command L on my Mac, which is the shortcut for actually running um, if you're using VS Code, if you're using the Pixel Byte Studios Love 2D plugin, which I recommend, then you'll see that it does indeed say cookie clicker in text. It's all sort of um, small at this point because it's just at native resolution. I'm at 720p, but it does indeed work. We have a very beginning sort of bootstrapped uh, 2D game. It's not much of a game. There's not much going on, but uh, we're, we have gotten started. Blue Booger says, have you ever gotten a Love 2D game working on the web? Yes, actually. Um, using a mscripten um, library called Love.js. You can take a look at that if you look it up on GitHub. It actually works pretty well. There are some, there are some problems that we encountered with it uh, initially, but to my experimentation, much of the functionality that you would get does work. It doesn't work, I believe, with uh, version 11 onwards. It's only 0.10.2. So if you are expecting it to work, you're going to have to make sure that you're using 0.10.2 as your Lua version, your Love 2D version, rather. And then that will be mscript and compilable. Um, OK, Lua is also a wonderful pun for those who don't know port uh, moon in Portuguese instead of SOL, which means sun. Yes, indeed, uh, says Asley. Yeah, Lua, uh, that's one of the first points I think I even bring up in the games course is that it's uh, Portuguese for moon. Um, and it's uh, fitting that Lintz was even speaking Portuguese. Just found out the median midterm for 124 was a 50%, but median's grade was A minus last year, so I'm feeling pretty cheery this morning. CS50 is amazing, by the way, perhaps the best intro US class in the world. Interesting. Um, ASMR, are you, in, are you taking um, 124 at Harvard, actually? I apologize if we, if we talked about this before. I don't 100% um, remember. Is there a Colton Wiki like David CS50 or cs.harvard.edu slash mailin that says asks Nate? Um, no, at the moment there is not. I have not. I don't have a CV, so I don't have one to put up on cs.harvard.edu like David does. And David is also officially um, faculty at Harvard, and I am not officially faculty. He is a professor. IntelliSense and CS50. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. IntelliSense and CS50. Best intro CS, sorry, iOS autocorrect. Are you referring to VS Code ASMR? If you could elaborate on that, I appreciate that. And uh, Ellen1 asks, can you talk about the use cases of Lua? Absolutely. So there's this game framework, Love2D, which is excellent, whether you're prototyping or even releasing commercial games. There's a, a famous game um, called, what is it called? It's called uh, uh, Move or Die, I believe. This game is written in Love2D, uh, at least per my 
Yeah, it is. Engine is, is, is love, as you can see here. This is a, a pretty famous game. Uh, it's on Steam. You can download it on Steam and I think other platforms. This is a game that is officially, um, that is officially released on, um, or sorry, that is officially developed in Love2D, completely Love2D. Therefore, I imagine it probably is pretty easy to mod because Lua, just by the way that it works and Love2D, it's pretty easy just to add modules, Lua modules, and change the source code and even to see the source code. So it's probably pretty moddable. Um, but you can absolutely release commercial games using Love. You can release, you can prototype your game in Love if you're, for example, um, developing something that you know you're going to have to maybe use Godot or Unity 2D or some other framework to create a game in 2D and then release officially. You can prototype it in Love 2D because it's very easy to get up and running. I would say it's, you know, Love 2D is a pretty fast binary. It's a C++ binary that just uses Lua as its scripting layer. So it's pretty efficient. I don't even necessarily know if I would, if you're going to prototype a full game and release it somewhere else, I would say maybe half the time you probably don't even need to release it in some other framework. You probably just release it in Love 2D. But separate from Love 2D, Lua is used in industry a lot for in, in C++ compiled game engines as the scripting layer. Um, it was used for many years uh, until Unity came around because Unity now was kind of the, what I think, I don't know what the numbers would be offhand, but I'm inclined to say probably 40% at least of studios now are using Unity and a smaller number are using Unreal and then a smaller number are using an in-house um, stack. And even in Unity, you can still use Lua using something called Moonsharp. So it's possible to script in Lua with Unity, but uh, Unity uses C Sharp as its scripting language. So it's a little bit of a different environment. Um, but Lua is a originally designed to be sort of a language that you use to prevent recompilation of a, of a binary, essentially. Allow you to interact with an a engine or, or a program and to just rapidly change things without needing to recompile. At least that was its original intended use case. That ends up making it very suitable for games where recompilation can be expensive, especially back in the day where it was big C++ C code bases that could take many minutes to recompile. Um, and so now it's used a lot for lightweight engines like this. It's used for modern C++ or C or other game engines. Um, for example, recently I saw it used in the context of the game Don't Starve Together. I believe that was written in Lua, uh, or rather scripted in Lua. It has a C++, I imagine, backend. Um, Starbound is another game that I know personally used Lua as its scripting layer. So it's all over the place. You'll see it all over the place. Um, and ASMR says, I was just saying, oh, I just found out you guys are streaming on Twitch. Awesome. I was saying that CS50 is probably the best intro CS class in the world. Professor Malin and his staff are amazing. I was just looking about how IntelliSense might both help and confuse completely noob programmers. So thanks, ASMR Gaming, for tuning in. Appreciate it. Um, it's cool that you're actually um, taking courses here on Harvard campus and tuning in. IntelliSense can be, I think, to a, maybe a beginning programmer, it can be kind of tricky. The nice thing about IntelliSense and VS Code is it's not too intrusive. Uh, and it's nice if you have the right plugins, it'll actually help you out quite a bit. I know that, for example, I can say function love dot, and it'll actually tell me all of the namespaces and stuff like that that are present in Love 2D without me having typed them before. IntelliSense, uh, a lot of the time, will just kind of uh, refer back to things you'd already typed in your program. It'll refer to variables that you've already seen. But the nice thing about having VS Code and having certain extensions installed is that you can actually see just by typing something, you know, the arguments that go into a function. If you're in Python, this can be very helpful, or JavaScript. You can auto-compile things in C, which is great. If you want that sort of behavior and not have to recompile, you can see error messages. You get an experience that's very akin to a dynamically typed experience like Python, um, but it's great. Yeah, IntelliSense can be a bit of a, a, a hurdle, but I think it probably does more harm than good, or more good than harm. Um, especially for folks getting started in a more dynamic environment. Um, and then CS50 for lawyers, I think that is in the process of being produced, but yeah, we, we did shoot that earlier this year. Awesome, so let's go ahead now and get back into the actual flow of implementing the game. Currently, we just have this black window. It's a bit on the dull side. Um, we've seen this a million times already, but it's, you know, it's a fun, cool process seeing the game 
implemented you know, from this black box and then getting all this functionality. What I'm doing here is I'm actually defining a function called love.keyPress, which takes a key. And um, what, this, what this is is a function that love2d actually calls for you every single frame whenever you press any key uh, on your keyboard. So it'll actually call this function. Now it's empty by default, so it doesn't do anything. It's up to you to actually define what should go on in the function and to you know, tell love2d, oh, when I press uh, w, I want my, my character to move forward. If I press escape, I want to quit the game, which is actually what I'm going to do here. I'm going to say if key is equal to escape. And once again, I still haven't updated my love2d to be um, the right, or my, uh, I haven't updated VS code since the last update where it messed up the Lua auto formatting. So it's a bit of a problem, but we'll, we'll get by it. I'm actually getting used to it at this point. But if key is equal to escape, what I want to do is I want to quit the game. So I can say love.event.quit. And then now if I run the game and I hit escape, I don't have to press command Q. I don't have to click the red circle anymore. I can just hit command Q. So, or I can just hit escape and it quits the game. So pretty nice. Saves me a little bit of effort, I guess. It adds a little bit to the UI. This lets me sanity check that input is working so we can actually start doing other inputs. Um, I will need, for this game, a function called love.mousepressed, which takes an X, a Y, and a button. As you can imagine, mice typically have more than one button. They have multiple. They have a left click. They have a right click, a middle click. They might have side clicks if you're using a fancy gaming mouse. So I care about whether you know which button I click on the mouse, I want it, whether I want it to be a left click or a right click. I might also care about whether the, uh, where the X and the Y position of the mouse are. I might want to check to see if I'm inside a box somewhere. I might want to see, for example, whether I'm clicking on the cookie. So this will, we will actually use here in just a little bit. Um, uh, ASMR says, I love how 50 starts with C only. You don't get confused by high level languages that way. Uh, that have way too much functionality are implemented in lower level languages such as C. Learning C first is absolutely perfect for obtaining a solid fundamental understanding of how computers work. Uh, yeah, I think I would agree. I think David would definitely agree too. I think that's a, a huge part of the course's motivation. Definitely sort of lay this foundational layer upon which you can build the knowledge you need to understand dynamic languages and sort of jump in wherever you feel like you want to, whatever domain you want to explore. Um, I can see how C also can be a bit of a hump for a lot of beginners because of pointers and because of ma memory management and a lot of very subtle bugs that are easier to handle in languages like Java or C or, uh, or Python or JavaScript that sort of manage memory for you and garbage collection. But definitely having that lower level understanding can be very helpful. And uh, C and C++ are obviously very important even in the world of dynamic programming languages because you, you need to have uh, your sort of more efficient things built in those languages. Like Love, for example, is built in C++, but it allows us to interact with the functionality we've defined using Lua so that um, we provide a good programming experience, but we still get as much efficiency as we need. Um, let's go ahead and think about what the first thing we want to see is. And that is probably a cookie, maybe right here in the center. So if I uh, look online, I could probably find a, a nice big image of a cookie. So that might be what I want to do. Another thing that I want to do probably is make it more lower resolution. But maybe we'll worry about that uh, at another time. We'll just say I want a, a larger cookie imported into my game, or a, a large cookie image imported into my game so that I can click on it and have you know, some, something more than just text. right? So what I like to do is I like to go to opengameart.org. And I, I briefly looked on here earlier just to see if there were any cookie sprites. There was one, which we might be able to use. And it's a little bit odd just because this one, I can't tell if it has a background or not. And it's not completely flush with the edges, which might cause a slight issue. But um, we can certainly use this, I think. So I'm actually going to try it out. It's open game art slash content slash cookie dash zero. It's under a public domain license, so it's free to use. So it's awesome. It's the great thing about open game art. Everything is very generously sort of made available to the public for free. I'm going to download this. I'm going to go ahead and click it. It's going to download into my, wherever my default downloads folder is. Let's go ahead and figure out where that is. Should be in here, cookie.png. Excellent. So it's 800 by 600 pixels. Uh, I'm not entirely sure whether it's flush with the edges. I don't think it might be. So I might need to actually edit this. So I'm going to bring it up op into uh, a sprite, which is my uh, sort of sprite editing program. And it is indeed not quite flush with the edges, which if we were just to use the dimensions of this sprite of this um, cookie as being our um, where, where we want to check for the x and y, you can imagine that 
we, we, we'd bring the cursor out here, for example, and it would still trigger a, a click on the cookie, which we don't want necessarily. And we, could all, we will also get a little bit of this area, even if we do use it as a box, which will cause issues with our XY. And we could probably write a function that checks to see whether a point is inside a circle. I'd have to Google that to find the exact algorithm because I'm not sure. Um, but we'll, for simplicity, just use the bounding box of the cookie, but we'll tighten the bounding box. We're actually going to crop this cookie image such that it is right on the edge. Now where, let's see, the edge looks like it's right about here and here, I think. Yep, so that's perfect. I'm gonna just go ahead and do that. Bring it right to the edge there. And now I can go up to, I should be able to just go to Sprite Crop and then Save. And then now everything is very tight. That sprite image, its boundary box is completely touching the cookie. So it'll be roughly approximate to, you know, if we, if we check the bounding box of the cookie for whether we've clicked on it, it'll be very close. It, we'll be able to sort of click on, the, on these edges and that won't be entirely accurate, but it'll be good enough to at least get us started. And if we wanted to, we could look up on Google, we could say, how do I get a point inside of a circle? Point inside circle um, algorithm. And um, yeah, so you, what you could do is get the distance. And I believe it's a square root of like x2 minus x1 uh, uh, plus uh, xy2 minus y1 or something like that. I don't remember offhand, but it, it, there is a formula for it that you can check to see whether uh, the point exists. And actually, if we look in here, we might even see it. Um, uh, x minus center x squared plus um, y minus center y squared less than the radius squared. Um, there is an easier way. I thought it was the, oh, right, because that's the distance formula. And you check to see whether the distance formula equates to um, the di uh, whether the distance of your xy is less than the distance of radius square, radius times 2. Why is it ra it's not radius squared, is it? It's radi isn't it just radius times 2? Um, it looks like it's radius squared. But anyway, we won't get too concerned about the math for right now. We can, we can worry about that another time. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take this cookie sprite, and I'm actually going to put it in the right location. So now we have a very tight, condensed cookie sprite. I'm going to copy this over to where I have my repo, dev, streams, cookie clicker. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a graphics folder, which this is conventional. You put it in your project. You're going to want to uh, file for all of your source code files. You want a project for or a folder for your graphics, for your sounds, and for your libraries, all kinds of things. I'm going to go ahead and just do this. I'm going to rename it to lowercase cookie, just because the capital letter kind of bothers me a little bit. Um, and then I'm going to quit a spread, because I don't need it anymore. So now we have an image that we can just draw in our scene. So if I go over to back to my main.lua, and let's say I want to say um, cookie texture is equal to love.graphics.new image. And then we'll say graphics slash cookie.png. Now I have a graphics image, a new image that I can draw somewhere in my, in my program, right? I've loaded it into this variable called cookie texture, which is an object that's going to store that texture information. And if I go down here to love.draw, instead of love.graphics.print, I'm just going to say love.graphics.draw that cookie texture. And if I run it, you do indeed see that I have this cookie in the middle of my screen. Now, it's a little large, actually. I don't know if I want it to be quite that large. So what I'm actually going to do, and this is more preferable to how I personally like to do things, I'm going to load up this cookie again into a sprite. And I'm going to just shrink the sprite size down by 2. I'm, it's 478. I'm going to make it, uh, we'll make it 240, right? It's going gonna, it's gonna to filter it. I'm going to save it. And now if I go ahead and I, I do this again, you do indeed see that we have a smaller cookie texture that will be, I think, a little bit more appropriate. We don't want it to be quite as massive. Uh, and I also want to change the resolution of the window, too, because it's kind of square at this point, and that's not what you usually are going to draw your game at. Um, but we're making our way there. Um, and then Bavic Knight says x squared plus y squared less than radius squared. Yeah. Uh, it's a great editor, but as a new programmer, definitely stick with one OS first. I tried to do Mac OS, Ubuntu, and Windows in parallel and failed miserably. Yeah, it can be overwhelming. Um, different operating systems have different programming environments. The nice thing about Mac OS, and at least Linux, is that they're kind of similar. They're both Unix-based operating systems. So you do get a very similar experience at the terminal, at the command prompt, using things like LS and CAT and using um, command line text editors and, and whatnot if you decide to do that. And the compilation process is generally consistent 
consistent. Using Windows is different because all of the shortcuts are changed, um, and there are a lot of idiosyncrasies with Windows. The nice thing is Windows now has the ability to actually integrate uh, Linux using um, Windows subsystem for Linux. So you can actually install Ubuntu and whatnot on your Windows machine as sort of a subsystem and then use that so you get a native sort of Linux environment, uh, at least feeling like a Linux uh, native environment while you're on your Windows machine. So it's quite nice. Whipstreak says, Python greater than JavaScript, greater than R, greater than Lua. Never study C. Uh, interesting, yeah. Um, I don't know if I, I, I agree with that, Whipstreak. I think it's important to understand C because it's very, very close to the hardware of your machine. Um, C is just kind of a light layer uh, on top of assembly, which itself is a light layer on top of your CPU's instruction set. Um, and understanding how a CPU works, understanding how C and assembly work, I think are pretty valuable. You don't necessarily need to know how it works, I think, to do modern development, but I think having that edge certainly puts you at an advantage. Um, Ba, ba, ba. Could you not use an overlay or a stencil as some sort of hitbox for a bit more accuracy, says M. Kloppenberg. Uh, I'm not entirely sure that Love2D supports um, the idea of uh, just uh, in, like, uh, plugging in an XY to a stencil and having that record a collision value. You, I guess you could do it in some sort of way like that, but I think that's a bit uh, over-engineered at this point. I, I would probably just use the distance formula the x squared plus x y less than radius squared and, and use that. I think that's probably better and easier and probably faster, than, honestly, than using a stencil. We used stencils in the games course for a graphical effect when we had, um, when we had uh, doorways in the Legend of Zelda P set. We ended up needing to use a stencil so that you could walk in between different rooms different, um, and then walk through a doorway and have part of that be visible and part of it be invisible. Stenciling I usually think of in the, that kind of context, but yeah, yeah, I guess you could think of, you could also use stencil in like this, a, a stencil buffer in that sort of way and check for one and zero and whatnot. I don't necessarily think I do it in this context. WW Fulina just joined, how far along are we in the project? Not very far at all. We've done so far this much code. We have our basic bootstrap up. We're importing our cookie texture, which is basically just a cookie image I grabbed online, stored in our graphics folder. Um, I'm, I have a load function that just says the title, a key handler for escape, which just says if we press escape, quit the game. Um, and then we're just drawing love.graphics.draw that cookie texture, which just draws it by default at 0, 0, the top left corner. Still don't like C, so many semicolons. Yeah, I don't like the syntax. I think I don't like developing too much in C, but I think understanding how it works is, uh, is valuable. Um, Nod Davis, uh, or Nada Vision says, why Lua? Not really into this, just curious. Um, Lua is a pretty popular scripting language in game development. It's also very lightweight. It's fast, uh, especially amongst the dynamic languages. And uh, we're using it in the context of Love 2D, which is a very nice, uh, lightweight, low-level feeling, but still very powerful and fast 2D game development framework, which makes it very easy to prototype games um, because you have a lot of control, but everything is very accessible. You can use polar coordinates for circle, but again, we are in similar to Cartesian coordinate system. Uh, at that point, um, I, I would need a refresher on my on my trigonometry, Bavik, but you, you might have a, a lower, uh, you might have a, a better understanding of that than I do at this point. Night Chris says, hello. Python is literally translated to C at each implementation step and then compiled using a C compiler into machine code. Um, I wouldn't go so far as to say it's translated to C at each implementation step. I would say that it is translated to Python bytecode, which is run in a virtual machine that is written in C. Um, and then those get translated to machine, that gets translated to, uh, to your processor's machine code by, via the, the, the virtual machine. You know, the virtual machine maps those bytecode instructions to your physical CPU's instructions. But translating it to C I don't think is necessarily accurate. But you can definitely use C um, plugins, but those are compiled down to machine code. I love semicolons because of JavaScript. Uh, understanding is crucial, yes. Um, so we have a cookie being drawn here on our screen. Let's take care of a couple of other steps. Let's go ahead and say love.window.setMode to uh, 1280 by 720 because I don't like the resolution that we were running at before. It's by default 800 by 800 or 600 by 600 or something. Not terribly, um, not terribly great, at least uh, per my eye. I'm used to seeing 16 by 9 resolution. I'm not such a fan of square resolution. 
And let's go ahead and draw our cookie at a slightly different position because it's, it's kind of up to the top left, but I want it to be centered more or less. And um, what we can do is we can say, um, so we, we know that we want to draw it at 1280 by 720. So what I can say is, let's go ahead and implement some constants. Let's say window width is going to be 1280. Let's say window height is going to be 720. And let's set these to the proper constants. And let's say that I want to draw the cookie text right in the middle of the screen. I can say, draw it at you know, a given x, y right here. So the x, y is going to be window width divided by 2 and window height divided by 2, for example, as a starting point. And if I, if I do that, we can see that it gets kind of shifted to the, to the lower right a little bit. And that's because everything does get drawn relative to its top left corner, not relative to its center, at least with regard to textures. right? Circles actually get drawn relative to the center, which we could have implemented this using a circle object or circle um, uh, graphic with love.graphics.circle, not quite what we're going for here. So in order to uh, uh, sort of compensate for this fact, this shift, we actually need to subtract some value from our x and y that we're drawing the cookie at, which we're going to subtract half the width and half the height of the cookie so that it gets sort of drawn right at its center. So I can just subtract cookie texture uh, get width divided by 2. And same thing here, I can subtract cookie texture get height divided by 2. And if, I, if I'm not mistaken, which it looks like I'm not, we do indeed have our cookie drawn right in the middle of the screen. Um, I'm actually going to draw the cookie a little higher, too. I don't necessarily like exactly um, how low it's getting drawn. So I just shifted it up maybe a little bit more, maybe minus 64 on the Y. Yeah, that looks about right. So things are moving along. We now have a cookie in the middle of our screen. It doesn't really do a whole lot. Um, and for that, we're going to need to figure out how to draw, how to click our cookie to generate some output, some textual output that at least shows us that we are indeed clicking our cookie, hence cookie clicker, and um, doing some work. Is this game going to be completed in this live stream, says Not a Vision? Uh, completed in as far as we will have cookies that we can click and cookies generating over time. We're not going to um, implement the entirety of the cookie clicker game that you see in the web browser, because that's a very large project with a lot of polish. Um, we're, we only have three hours, but we're going to get as far as we can in that direction. And by the end of the stream, I suspect that we'll have a fairly completed game, or at least a fairly completed prototype um, for a game. He's almost certainly right. He's one of the reasons why CS3 is so great. I'm Googling to learn more about what he just taught me now. This is ASMR gaming. I, I appreciate that. Thanks for, the, thanks for the kind words. If anybody has any questions, go ahead and let me know. Adam Fighter, are we going to add a crunch sound effect? We absolutely could. We could definitely do that. Um, Adam asks, did you finish Solitaire? Not yet. That's still uh, ongoing. We're taking a break away from that just for, uh, to, to cover this game and to you know, sort of have a change of scenery, implement something from start to finish. But Solitaire will resume either next week or the week after that, and details to come. Can the game still be played if cookies are disabled? Sorry, I'm a dad. I had to do it. I'll see myself out now. Uh, excellent joke, says uh, from Tuxman29, everybody. Let's give a virtual round of applause. Get some kappas in the chat for Tuxman. Uh, love it. Love the joke. Let's go ahead now and say, um, because remember, love.mouse pressed. We can test to see whether we're actually getting a, uh, the press to work in and of itself. The first thing that I want to do to get in that direction, I'm actually going to do love.graphics.print um, cookies uh, colon. And then we want to keep track of how many cookies we've actually generated, how many we've clicked to obtain. And so I can do this by saying dot dot to string cookies. And we haven't implemented, uh, we haven't added cookies yet to our, to our game. And dot dot you might not be familiar with, dot dot just means uh, add two strings together. It's the concatenation operator in Lua. You can't use plus like you could in Java, for example. Uh, in Lua, you do need to use dot dot to tell it that I'm adding strings together, add them one to the back. In JavaScript, let's use plus, for example, and there's all kinds of bugs that come out of that. Um, but you specifically need to use dot dot in this case. I'm going to go ahead and actually add that variable, cookies equals zero. And better practice is going to be to actually make all of these 
uh, local variables, right? So if you have top level variables in your Lua module, and let's say you have other bits of code, other files, and you don't want these variables accessible from within those other files, you're gonna wanna make sure these are set to local. Make sure they are local variables, local window width, local window height. They're still accessible in the same way that we've just been using them, but now if we have other Lua files in our code base, they won't be visible. By default, if we don't specify local, they will be visible from other files, and we don't necessarily want that. That can cause a lot of headaches. I'm going to go ahead now and um, let's just specify that this should be actually not printed, but I'm going to say print F for formatted print. And now what this is going to do is I can specify a few different things. I can say um, start relative on the, uh, let, let's just say uh, zero, zero. Let's say I'm going to start re uh, relative to the top left corner like before. Um, I'm, what I'm going to want to do is I'm actually going to want to center this text on the screen. And to do that, I'm going to specify after the x, y, I'm going to specify how much padding in which to center it. Basically, what's my column size? Uh, between how much size should I center this text, right? And I want, to, I want it to center across the entire screen. So I'm actually going to specify that as window width. And then I'm going to say center. I'm going to make sure that that gets centered um, and you can specify left, you'd also specify right. And if I rerun this, you do indeed see very tiny at the top, uh, cookies colon zero. But the unfortunate thing about that is that now we're using um, such a tiny font, it's kind of hard to see. I want to make this a little bit larger. What I can do is I can say uh, local large font is equal to love.graphics.newfont. And I should be able to just specify uh, 32. And what this will do is it'll just use my default font, which I think is Arial, and create a new font that's larger than the default, which I think is uh, 12 pixels, possibly. And so now if I go down uh, in my love.load and I just say love.graphics.setDefault, uh, set font rather, to large font, if I'm not mistaken, this should work. Indeed, it does. Now, cookies is set to zero, but it's large. I can actually see it without having to squint my eyes super tiny. So we've made a bit of progress. Um, and actually, I don't necessarily like how high that is, how close that is to the edge. I'm actually going to specify that, that should be 16 pixels from the top. And now it's just a little bit of padding, which is nice. Can you show what extensions you're using for your VS Code, asks Nipsis. Um, so I don't use a whole lot of extensions, but the one that I am using for, for Love2D is called um, Love2D Support by Pixelbyte Studios. And if I go over here, you can see that I do indeed have Love2D Support by Pixelbyte Studios. It's pretty easy to search for in VS Code. It's got 16,000 downloads, very highly reviewed, although you can't see it. It should be five roughly five stars. This allows you, if you're on a Mac, to just press Command-L and assuming that you have love installed in your applications folder, you can just hit command L and this will sort of just pull up love for you uh, without you needing to click and drag to a folder or needing to alias love in your terminal and then run it like I usually do. Um, super nice. If you're on Windows, you can just use Alt L and you will need to specify the path um, potentially depending on your setup. But assuming, assuming that you have specified the path for your, um, your love 2D executable, it'll just pull it up and sort of act as if it's clicking and dragging your folder over to that executable for you. So super nice quality of life improvement if you're developing in Love2D using VS Code. Um, and everybody enjoyed Tuxman's, Tuxman's awesome cookies joke. Uh, keep, keep those coming for sure. So now I have zero cookies. Let's test to make sure that I can actually increment my cookies um, and actually generate more than just zero, right? In my love.mousepressed, I can say, if button is equal to one, then cookies equals cookies plus one. And uh, by default, Lua uh, uses one as your left click and two as your right click. And if you have multiple mice, uh, multiple mouse buttons on your um, on your mouse, they could potentially be more than two, three, four, five, six, depending on depending on the specific mouse that you have. I have a gaming mouse at home that's got probably seven or eight buttons on it, some of which I didn't even know existed prior to doing a little bit of research on it. Can Love2D be used for mobile games? Um, can it be used for mobile games? I think it can. I actually haven't tested this myself, but on the Love2D wiki, they do claim, at least um, per what I saw before, um, that you can co uh, compile it to Android, you can compile it to iOS. Uh, so I would do a little bit of research and see um, maybe if we go to the wiki, maybe there's a little bit more information. Game distribution. Let's see. iOS. Basic instructions for iOS without fusing are available at getting started. Call, uh, hash iOS. So it does indeed look like there is some 
um, information on how to get it to work. Based on what I can see here, it does indeed seem the case that you can. I haven't tested it myself. I don't do a lot of mobile development, um, but this is cool. If you're looking to get into mobile development with Love2D, it looks like it's definitely doable. And Linz is vouching that, you, vouching that you can indeed do so. So now if I run the game and I click, notice that every time I click, my cookie amount is increasing. So we now do have a way, you know, this is the core game loop of Cookie Clicker. We have officially um, sort of implemented the core mechanic of the game, which is the click to get cookies. So I mean, at this point, we can just wipe our hands and say Cookie Clicker implemented, right? Everything's all set and done. We don't have much farther to go. Um, but as we covered earlier, there are indeed multiple other facets of the game that make it more interesting than just merely clicking on a cookie the whole time to generate cookies, right? We could do much more than this. Nick DeWay says, is it your birthday today, Colton? Yes, it is indeed my birthday. 28 years old today. It's uh, starting to sink in a little bit. Um, so, oh, and also for iOS games, you still have to transfer your Love 2D project to Xcode on Mac OS. Interesting, I did not realize that. That is a consideration. Although, it was my uh, belief or understanding that you could theoretically still do this on a Windows or Linux machine with the right um, modules. I'm not 100% sure. Um, because I haven't done it myself, but you know, we'll see. Not a vision, Nick the way, and McKinnon222, thank you very much for the birthday wishes. I much appreciate it. Um, everybody is so, so kind. Um, so the first thing, if we want to evolve this beyond just merely clicking our cookie, clicking our screen to get cookies, um, well, we could do a couple of things. We could first uh, detect whether we are indeed within the box of our cookie, um, w whether our mouse is there by well, normally there's an effect that we get. There's a sort of a graphical effect. When you hover over the cookie, it sort of expands a little bit, and we could certainly do that too. Um, so if I say in love.update, if um, love.mouse.getposition, or rather, what I need to do is say local xy is love.mouse.getposition, and then if x is uh, less than or equal to or rather, if x is greater than or equal to, um, and we should probably cache this. Do we want to cache this information? I can say window width divided by 2. Or rather, let's, let's do this. Let's say local um, left and top, right, bottom. Uh, well, we can't do it. It'll get too, too uh, bloated if we do that. We'll say local left is equal to window um, width divided by 2 minus, how did I do it? Cookie texture get width. So that would be the left side of our cookie. So we're basically saying window width divided by 2 minus cookie texture get width. Um, and actually, we can ca calculate all this information up top and not need to worry about it. And that, I think, is actually going to be much better. So let's do that. Let's say local left up at the very top is going to be window width divided by 2 minus cookie texture get width. So let's do that. The reason that I don't want to calculate this every time in update is because love.update is actually running 60 times a second. So if I'm calculating this 60 times every second, um, it's going to get a bit, um, well, let's just say it'll, it'll run, but it'll be subpar in terms of efficiency. If I can just calculate this information, if it doesn't change, I don't need to calculate it every frame. I can just set it up here, right? I can say local left is equal to window width divided by 2 minus cookie texture get width right here. And local right is equal to window width divided by 2 uh, minus cookie texture get width. Um, oh, and actually, this should be divided by 2 plus cookie texture get width. So what this is going to do is it's actually going to get that left edge. Actually, what we do is we'll just say left plus cookie texture get width. And now we have our left and right edges of the cookie. So we can start testing for collision this way. But we can also use this left value now to draw the cookie instead of needing to calculate this down in the render function, which will save us even more efficiency. Not that it's tremendous, but little things like this do add up. I'll say local up is going to be equal to window width divided, or window height divided by 2. Or rather, this should be top. Local top is going to be window width height divided by 2 plus, um, and how do we have it set down here before? We had it set to 
minus quickie texture get height. So minus quickie texture get height divided by divided by two. And then I think we minus 64. Yep. So minus 64. And then bottom, as you can imagine, is just top plus cookie texture get height. And now we've calculated these four values. We don't ever have to calculate them again. I can come down here to where we did calculate it. And I can just say, I want to draw my cookie at, uh, let's say, left and top. Right, and so now, uh, then expected near end, which is on 46, which I need to get rid of this because I had it was incomplete. And then now everything still gets rendered, but now we're just saying draw the cookie at left top. We're not calculating, you know, this offset of the of the cookie's width and height anymore in the in the draw function. And the draw function, just like update, also takes place 60 frames a second. So whatever calculation we can get out of draw, out of update, we actually save ourselves quite a few cycles. Now I can say in here, this is where I can actually perform the logic for checking for whether the cookie's inside or whether the cursor's inside the cookie. I can say if x is uh, greater than or equal to left, and x is uh, less than or equal to right, and y is greater than or equal to top, and y is less than or equal to bottom, then I can say, um, and this, is, this should sort, uh, short circuit. So if any of these become false, I'll just exit that if statement, um, which saves time as well. If, x is a, uh, if that's the case, what I want to do is say uh, I want to have a global. I want to actually have a scale var variable. So I want to say scale is true, uh, or rather I should say make cookie bigger is equal to true uh, equal to false, and then I can make cookie bigger equal to true. I can say uh, make cookie bigger is equal to true, else make cookie bigger is equal to false. And what I could also do is I could say make cookie bigger is equal to this whole expression, and that will work just as well. I can get rid of all of that, right? I've essentially said make cookie bigger is equal to the truth or false value that this whole condition sort of evaluates to, whether x is greater than or equal to left and x is less than or equal to right, um, which means basically just making sure it's within the bounds of our square. Um, and then so down here, the nice thing I can do now that I know whether my cookie should be drawn bigger or not is I can pass in an extra value to the draw function. I can say draw the cookie texture uh, at left top. Don't rotate it. Zero rotation. Um, but I can pass now a scale value into the, the next two parameters. I can say, let's, let's say maybe um, uh, I want it to be 1.2 times larger. So I'll say um, 1 point, um, or 1, or rather cookie texture, cook, make cookie bigger and 1.2 and or, and 1 .2 or 1. Same thing here. And I'll explain this in a second if you're confused. Make cookie bigger and 1.2 or 1. Let me just make sure this is working before I, before I uh, sort of test it. But you can indeed see that we are scaling the cookie as soon as we hover over it. Now, the unfortunate thing is that it's scaling relative to its top left corner. You can see that it's sort of blowing up, well, other way, relative to its top left corner. Um, but it's, uh, it is indeed scaling when we hover our mouse over that box. So we're checking the x, y of our mouse for whether we're inside the box. And if we are, we're setting some value to true. If that value is true, we're just increasing the scale value of our cookie. So what we're doing is we're basically saying, is make cookie bigger equal to true? If it is, insert 1.2 here. If not, just insert 1. A scale factor of 1, if we're just scaling something times 1, it's just times, it's, it's just an identity scale. It just means that we just need to make sure that it's uh, the same size that it should be. But if uh, 1.2 scale factor means it should be 20% larger, right? And so that gives the effect of being 20% larger. So this and or syntax is just the ternary syntax that you get in something like C or JavaScript. It just means essentially this colon, uh, this question colon, right? It just means do this thing. If it's true, do whatever is after the question mark. If it's false, do whatever is after the colon. In Lua, it's 
If it's true, do whatever is after the and. If it's false, do what's after the or. And that's just the way that Lua does its ternary expressions. It doesn't have a, a, que a question mark colon like other languages like C or JavaScript. It has the and or. Am I the only one playing cookie clicker while watching this is not a vision? I'm glad that you're getting into the atmosphere of the game. Um, and certainly, I think it adds motivation if you can see all of the features that the actual game ends up adding to it. Uh, SLCH000, unlimited frame rate. Uh, I'm not sure what, what you're referring to, but um, oh, uh, if you're saying uh, don't, uh, if, you're, if we're not frame rate capping, um, but yeah, that's uh, if we have a powerful enough machine, maybe you know, just center it. SLC says, um, and that's actually the next goal. So the next goal is actually going to be basically we just need to copy this what we have here, because what Love2D does, or what the draw function does, in addition to giving us this sort of scale factor, this x, y that we can scale by after the texture, the x and the y, the, the rotation amount, which we don't want a rotation value, which is why we're saying 0, then the x, y scale factor, we also have an x, y origin amount. And so this x, y origin amount is actually going to be where we want to scale the image by and actually draw the image by. And so what we're going to do here is say make cookie bigger and uh, cookie texture get width divided by 2 or um, uh, I guess that would be 0. And then the same thing here, make cookie bigger and cookie texture get height or divided by 2 or 0. If I'm not mistaken, this should end up, this should end up actually, oh, whoa, that's not exactly what I wanted it to do. Um, interesting. That might be a blunder. Oh, I think it's because we're not, we're still not drawing it correctly. Um, since if we're drawing it, cor if we are rendering it, um, so this is, the, this is the other problem that we run into. So when, you're, when, you, when we decide that we want to, um, and you can see that the, the draw function itself is getting quite uh, large and complicated. And this is part of the problem with dealing with scaling and rotation and origin offsetting. Um, this function is very powerful, very flexible, allows us to do a bunch of different things, but it can be a little bit unwieldy. It's sometimes a little bit easier to separate all of the parameters on different lines if we run into this issue. Um, if we are drawing the, um, if we're, If we know that we want to offset our origin, we need to account for the origin offset for the uh, uh, when we're uh, down here, because when we're drawing, when we're basically when we're setting the origin to a different location, it draws the cookie at a different location. It's what what it's basically doing is every time we're not we're shifting the origin when we're when we're um, when we are hovering our mouse over the cookie and it's expanding. The origin is getting sent to the center. That's what we're doing here. We're basically, these last two arguments are where the new origin of the cookie is, where it should scale from, or whether, where it should draw from. And so if we make that the center, it'll scale from the center, but it'll also draw from the center. And what that means is that that x, y we're passing it, it's now, it's now drawing the cookie at the, uh, from the center point, and so that's why it's looking like it's shifting up. That x, y normally is where the corner should get drawn, not where the center should get drawn. And so that's why it's flickering back and forth. We can just do something similar here. We can say make cookie bigger and, um, uh, or rather, left plus. So this is what we need to do. We need to basically add the, um, we need to add half of the width and half of the height to the x, y if we're offsetting the origin to the center of the cookie. So what we can do is we can say left plus um, make cookie bigger and um, cookie texture get width divided by 2 or 0 plus make cookie bigger and cookie texture get height divided by 2 or 0. And what this should do, oh, whoops. Um, Put that into a uh, some parentheses here, and now you can indeed see that we hover our mouse 
over the cookie. Not only does it scale, but it stays inside the center where we are drawing it. We are essentially uh, uh, taking into consideration that offset, adding it back to the xy, um, because when it gets drawn relative to the center point versus the top left, that's going to put it in different locations, obviously, or at least make it look like it's in different locations. We need to account for this when we're scaling our cookie and shifting its origin. And this just has to deal with us um, dealing with the fact that everything in Love2D and in most environments is relative to the top left as opposed to being relative to the center. If this were an engine where all operations, scaling and drawing, were relative to the center point, um, well, this would be a little bit easier to deal with. But in this case, it's not quite the same way. Um, SLCHOOO says, you said it draws at 60 frames per second, wondering if this is a limit or not. I think technically you can override Love2D's frame rate. Um, and there's a love.run function. Um, let me see. Actually, I haven't looked this up in too much detail. Let me see. Um, <laughs> I had read somewhere that um, the default is 60 frames, but I do think that there is a way for you to change it yourself. Um, but you have to kind of get into, I think, a little bit more of the nitty gritty and actually mess with the love.run function. So love.run um, is a function that sort of gets run for you underneath the hood, where this is your main loop, essentially. And that's what this is right here. And in here, actually, you might be able to see if they do the 60 frame per second cap. Hmm. It may not be the case that they actually enforce 60 frames per second. Um, I had thought so. I might have to do more research and, and see. But this is the function that sort of manages your update and your draw and your load and all that stuff. And based on what I can see, it might be actually in the love.timer function, the love.timer.step. That might be uh, part of where they do the actual 60 frames per second limitation. Um, but from my understanding, it was 60 frames. It could, not, it could be unrestrained, as far as I'm aware. Uh, I'd have to take a look and see. Um, not a vision saying, surprise how readable this syntax is for someone who's never used Lua. It's got very nice syntax, um, very similar to C. And that's kind of the reason that I think it's a great language to learn after lear taking CS50 and in the game dev course, because there's a lot here that is familiar. And there is a lot that actually looks similar to JavaScript, too. For example, this function here, and the fact that functions are first class citizens in, Lu in Lua, which just means that you can pass them around like data, like you can do in Python and JavaScript. Um, it's pretty great. Adam Antine says, Colton, what is the sprite maker you usually use? Um, I usually use a sprite. Um, I like it a lot, but you can use GIMP, you can use Photoshop, you can use paint.net, you can use uh, Microsoft Paint. There's a whole bunch of different things, as long as they all serve the same purpose as outputting a PNG and you have the ability to edit pixels. Usually that's all you need. Bahari is saying, a warlike situation between India and Pakistan, hope for betterment. Indeed. Sorry to hear that there is that going on. I, I briefly heard some of the, uh, the information that's going on. Um, wish you uh, all the safety if you happen to be in either of those areas at the moment. Adamantine says, um, I want to start working on my own game as well. Yeah, no, great. I definitely do so. Um, you can get started with, uh, I would say, maybe GIMP. Try out GIMP. Look for free sprite editors. Um, use open game arts art resources if you're um, not a necessarily a fantastic artist. Like, my, like, for example, I myself am not a great artist, so I typically use open game art resources. Um, do whatever, you know. Um, do whatever makes sense for you to be most productive in actually implementing uh, your own game. Um, OK, so let's go ahead now. Now that we have sort of centering and offsetting, and if curious, I'm going to pull up the documentation here uh, for uh, Love 2D uh, Graphics Draw. and. This is the function that we've just been using that has a lot of, as you can see, it has a lot of these parameters that we've been using so far. So we have the drawable, the texture, which you can use multiple different things as drawables, the x, the y, the rotation amount, the scale on the x and the y, the origin on the x and the y, 
And then the shear factor, which I'm not super, excuse me, super familiar with using myself in games. I've, I've seen it, um, but haven't actually used it. Uh, but we used every single one of these up until the shear factor, um, with the exception of rotation. We, we included it because we have to, because of the position. But we didn't actually end up rotating it by a certain amount. But this is the draw function. You could pass in just one parameter. You could pass in three. You could pass in four, six, or eight. And they do different, it'll do different things to certain your different use cases. Now, thankfully, we have our cookie that we've centered. And I can click and drag this. Um, but unfortunately, I can still click and uh, generate cookies outside of the cookie. So we need to solve that problem next. And the way that we can do that is by saying, um, if, or rather, in love.mouse pressed, if button is equal to 1 and make cookie bigger, well, now we can certainly click this as much as we want. But any time I try to click the cookie outside of that, well, I can't do it, right? So pretty nice, right? We have a, uh, the ability to make our cookie larger uh, on mouse over. And additionally, we have the ability to ensure that the mouse clicks the cookie or the mouse is clickable on the cookie whenever it's, or we, we have the ability to enforce that we can only click to generate cookies when our mouse is over the hitbox of the cookie. Any suggestion on how to use an iPad Pro with pencil for game dev? Oof, I'm not sure actually. iPad Pro pencil. Oh, is that the stylus thing? Uh, I would say probably because there aren't a tremendous amount of iPad Pros or, uh, or uh, development software for games on the iPad. And I, I haven't do done any research in this area, actually. So I could be completely wrong. Um, but I would assume that there's probably not very great IDE support for doing game development on an iPad. If there is, then by all means, give it a shot. But I would imagine using your iPad is more suitable for something, especially if you're using a pencil for like sprite development, for example. And also, I've neglected to shout out all of our followers. Cerul CS, who was the MVP in the last Solitaire stream. Shout out to Cerul. Thank you for the follow. Pansock, MC2, Juan Rombe, and have a look. Thank you all very much for follow. And there's an app called Codia, which is a game creating framework based on Lua. Is that an, ID, uh, an IDE on the iPad, actually, Tuxman? I'm not sure I'm familiar with that. Um, and pass your pencil against your iPad, says Adam Fighter 10101. That's funny. Um, hey, I, I think it's really cool if you can get an IDE working on the iPad. I just never have done any research to see. Um, and then shout out to David, who's in the chat. He says, thanks for tuning in, everybody, uh, which is awesome. Uh, Coral say, I'm talking about graphics and music, maybe. Um, yeah, for music, I know that certainly there are nowadays more music plugins and software packages for iPad than there used to be. And for graphics, there's a ton of applications that you can use to draw. So I think that definitely for the art side of things, you can definitely use an iPad. Less so, I think, for the code. I think that's something that's more still suited for doing it on a laptop or a desktop or whatnot. Um, cool. So we've made a lot of progress pretty fast. We have our cookie. We can click. So you know that's basically the game, right? We've, we, we're, we're all done at this point, right? Um, but no, there are other things that Cookie Clicker lets us do that sort of make the game interesting. And primarily, it's this idea of generating cookies passively over time. And that'll be the next, I think, major step in actually um, coding this. And another thing we could do if we wanted to get fancy, we could have little cookie graphics um, that come down the screen. And thanks, David, who said today is Today is Colton's birthday. Thankfully, uh, so many people have already found out and have uh, messaged in the chat already. So thanks to everybody again who, who, who said that. I much appreciate it. Um, but do I want to do the, do we want to do the graphic thing? I think we should worry. Well, well maybe we'll have that be a last sort of um, sparkle, sprinkle that we layer on top of our, our game. But for now, I think what we'll do instead is we'll worry about having different things that we can add to our game that'll generate cookies passively for us. Sort of take our fingers away from the cookies and implement a shop and let the game sort of work on our behalf, which is ultimately the goal, I think. And Harder Praj, thank you very much for the, for the wish. And Bavik Knight saying, we know, already wished. Um, about Kodi, a fully fledged code editor with built-in libraries. The projects are then transferable to Xcode on Mac OS to make it an actual app. Oh, so it is an iPad IDE. That's really cool. It's good to hear that there are IDEs being made for that environment. So we know 
that the, this cookie value, this is effectively going to be our currency. We're going to use this. Um, basically, all we're going to do is a subtraction, right? We're going to say, do we have enough cookies to buy this thing? And if we do, subtract the cookies, add to some generation rate of cookies over time, uh, and then we can just rinse and repeat this process sort of ad infinitum. Um, the first thing that we're probably going to want to do, and we'll make this sort of simple for now, I think, we'll, we'll have little icons at the bottom sort of representing the different things we can buy. So normally you get cursors, right, that'll, that'll add over time. Um, so we can do that. We'll say, um, well, actually, the first thing that we'll do, we'll say here, love.graphics, love.graphics.print f cookies uh, per second. Or rather, we'll just say C CPS for short right now, you know, which is, you know, everybody knows. Uh, Amtora, happy birthday, Colton. Bye. Thanks, Amtora. I appreciate it. Uh, goal is microtransactions. Exactly. Your mind is in the right place. We're going to monetize the crap out of this game uh, and become rich. And you're all going to come become rich with me. Um, we dot and Oswald Jones. Thank you very much for the follows. Uh, we're going to say. CPS, and we're going to two string a CPS variable that does not exist yet. Um, and then we're going to say um, 0, 32, rather 48, um, window width and center, right? Because we are going to draw this 48 pixels down on the screen. We're going to center it within the window width, starting it at the left side at 0. Um, and then we're going to center it, which is the string here. Now, we don't have a CPS variable yet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say local CPS is equal to 0. We don't have a cookies per second. If I run the game, we do get a CPS variable now. Notice that it's being drawn in a perfect place right below cookies, just like the actual game. If I click, nothing happens because we're not actually calculating this variable, this value, um, at all while we're playing the game. And it ain't anything very much for the birthday wishes. Much appreciated. CPS is going to be equal to 0. So what we should do now is every second, effectively, we need to keep track of um, how many cookies we generated. We're going to look at the last second, and then we're going to compare the number of cookies that were generated last second. Um, and then we're going to sort of see what our rate is, right? Uh, hi, Colton. Happy birthday. Have a great one. Thanks, Ed. Any much appreciate. Oh, I already saw that. Sorry. I was going to look LP Dodge 1. Thank you very much for the follow. Um, so let's figure out how we can better do this, so or how we can best do this. I'm going to say local last frame is going to be equal to, and there are different ways you can calculate this um, sort of per second value. You can store the last five seconds, calculate them sort of an interpolated a number of seconds. You can sum what are the last five or ten seconds. You can sum just. You can take just the last second, compare it to this second, and then keep doing this over and over again. Um, we'll start with the last second, and then maybe work our way up to the last five seconds. Um, so let's see. Uh, we'll say the last. Uh, we'll say cookies last frame. We'll say cookies last frame is going to be equal to zero, right? And we'll say. Um, local cookies, this frame is equal to 0. And we'll say local frame timer is equal to 0. And what this is going to do is we'll say in our update, basically, um, if frame timer plus dt is greater than or equal to 1. And if you're unfamiliar with dt, what dt is is delta time. And delta time is the number in seconds that have elapsed since the last frame. And usually this is 0.013 or something of that nature. And what this will let us do, therefore, is keep adding this. Um, uh, rather, what we should do is frame timer is equal to frame timer plus dt. If we do it just this way, it'll just add it and then not apply the actual change. So then we can say it's greater than or equal to 1. So if the so we'll first um, add to the timer. And then we'll say if the frame timer is greater than or equal to 1, which means a second has elapsed, we'll say um, uh, frame timer is equal to, fra uh, equal to 0, or rather, um, Mm, frame timer mod 1. 
And if I'm not mistaken, Lua does support fractional modulo, so that we can modulo a floating point value and get whatever the remainder is. Um, or it might actually not do that. Um, I don't think it does, actually. I take that back. So what we'll do is we'll just say frame timer minus 1. And what this will do is this will give us whatever the fractional amount is. If we ended up going slightly over 1 second, um, let's say 1.012 seconds, this will actually bring us, instead of bringing us back to 0 and losing some time information or adding extra time information to our calculation, this will sort of roll us over into the next second by point whatever that amount is, right? And so now in the mouse pressed, I can say um, cookies this frame should be equal to cookies this frame plus 1. And this will end up actually um, Um, so this will be keeping track of just what the cookies are this frame, uh, which means that we need to also reset that to zero when we get to the next, uh, when we get to, oh, not sorry, not frame. Frame is the wrong terminology. Should be seconds. Cookies this second. And then this should be second timer. That was a blunder on my part. Cookies last second. So we're not, we're not doing frame by frame cookie calculation. We're doing second by second cal cookie calculation. Um, so cookies last second, cookies this second, uh, last, um, rather, uh, second timer, all of that terminology is more accurate. So when, we, when the second timer rolls over to one, when, when, when a second has elapsed, we need to make sure that we set um, cookies this second equal to zero, right? Because we haven't actually generated any cookies this second. Um, but before we do that, we need to say cookies last second is equal to um, cookies this second. So we're bringing, the, we're bringing the cookies from this second back over so we have a reference to the last set of cookies. And what we can do is we can say, um, we, what we need to do is also say this, the, calculate the, um, the CPS, actually. So what we'll do is we'll say CPS is equal to cookies last second plus cookies this second. And then we'll divide that by 2. And now you can see how if we are keeping track of maybe 5 seconds worth of cookies, we'll have a more accurate frame count because we could um, generate 20 cookies this second and then one cookie on the next second. And that means we're effectively generating 10 cookies a second, even though we only clicked one time on this, this, this last second. Um, so it's, it's all based on how modular you want to get it or how um, granular you want to get your time calculations. In this case, for simplicity, we'll just use two seconds worth of data. And then we could easily just add more timers, more variables that keep track of maybe in a table or, uh, of arbitrary size that keep track of uh, the various last seconds in our game and therefore have a more accurate granular number. Um, so what we can do now is say, um, oh, actually, so here's the problem, though. This will, this will be volatile pretty fast. I mean, when we're clicking, it'll be volatile. But when we actually have things generating cookies per second, this will be a little bit more accurate and more meaningful. So. Hmm. I think this might be OK for now. Well, we'll use this for the time being. And let's say, let's see if this works. So if I click on this, notice that we are indeed getting um, a pretty high number, right? We're at 8, 7.5. Let's see how fast I can click this. See, it goes down to 3, then to 0. So if I click this really, really fast, see how fast I can type I can click on this. It looks like it's pretty hard to go above 8. But it's looking, it's looking pretty, pretty, pretty accurate, right? Um, and then ceiling. Uh, maybe we could have used ceiling. Well, we don't necessarily care about ceiling, Bavik, because we actually want the fractional value. Um, 
So we'll use that. We're, we're going to use that in this. We want this exact number per second. Because if you play the original game, you'll see that it does indeed say like 0.3 cookies per second, 0.2 cookies per second, et cetera. Um, now, when, once we start getting into things that maybe add cookies every 10 seconds, we run into an issue where we're not actually keeping track of um, the last 10 seconds. Um, we're only keeping track of the last second and the current second. So when we get a cookie, we're only going to see that we got one cookie per second the last second. But we're not actually going to see that, in fact, we're generating uh, 0.1 cookies per second, which is the more accurate metric. Again, um, the more granular we get with our time calculations, the more accurate this is going to be. For right now, we'll, we'll worry about that um, maybe later if we have time. So we have now the ability to see, OK, if I'm clicking. I can see that I'm actually getting six cookies per second, which is pretty good. Seven cookies per second, 7.5. Um, I would say that I hover around 7.5 pretty accurately, maybe 7 if I'm, if I'm being pretty bad. If I go really fast here, I can go up to 10, maybe 11, 11.5. So that's OK. But at this, the, this current implementation, I'm generating all these cookies, and I'm only ever capping at around 11 cookies per second. This doesn't feel great. This doesn't have any progression. I don't really get much out of this beyond just you know, being here and seeing, oh, I can, if I click really fast, I can generate a good amount of cookies. So let's actually implement generating cookies over time passively, which is, the, I would say, the main goal of the game, not necessarily just the clicking of the game. And to do that, let's go ahead and grab a cursor graphic, because the cursor is sort of the first thing that you get in, um, in Cookie Clicker, right? Which is this here, 3.png, it looks like. Um, just again, on Open Game Art, looking for, um, it's got Creative Commons license, public domain, very generous. I'm going to go over to my downloads. It's called 3.png, so I'm just click and drag it right over here. It's 23 by 23 by 26 pixels, which is fine. I'm going to rename it to cursor.png. Now, let's go ahead and draw this on the screen. I'm going to make a little area where I can click and uh, maybe have a little shop area at the bottom of the window, which just says, here's a cursor. And I have a little thing below it uh, where I can click that just says, if you want to buy a cookie it's going to, or a cursor, it's going to cost you 20 cookies. right? And maybe this value will go up over time, but um, it will be where we can start actually generating um, cookies passively for us. And here's where I'm going to say cursors is going to be equal to an empty table. I'm going to start with no cursors that do any updates. It's just going to be the cursor as it is. Or it's just going to be empty until I add a cursor, rather, to the table. Let's go ahead now and down here and draw. Below the cookie texture, I'm going to say love.graphics. Well, first of all, what I need to do is I need to actually create a new texture, because we have a new graphics file, right? So I can say local cursor texture equals love.graphics.newImage graphics slash cursor.png. Go down to cursor texture, right down here, or go down to uh, draw. And using my texture cursor, I can say love.graphics.draw cursor texture at, let's say, uh, let's say 32 from the x and window height minus 120. Let's, let's say that's where I, I feel like I want to draw the, the, the cursor. We'll do that. And now I can indeed see I have a little cursor down here at the bottom left. A little bit hard to see, arguably. Um, let's go ahead and bring it over to the right just a little bit more. Say it's 64, just like that. And maybe I want a I want some text below that that says love.graphics.print. And here I want to say love.graphics.set default font, which I believe that will just um, set the default font back to its uh, 32 pixel or a 16 pixel or 12 pixel size, whatever the default is. And then love.graphics.print, I'm going to say um, cursor. And then that'll be at 72. No, 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 that'll be at um, that'll be at 64. Uh, no, that'll be at 50. And then window height minus 90. All right, let's see, how's that work? Oh, OK, so I guess you can't do it with a default font here. Uh, you can't just pass in no value. It doesn't take that into consideration. I thought it did, but that's my mistake. I'll instead create a small font here called small font. 
And then we'll say new font of size 16. Um, rather, and I need to actually pass that in here. Um, set default font. Oh, I'm calling the wrong function. It should just be called set font, not set default font. In any case, uh, did it not save? Oh, right, set font. Now, oh, and actually centered pretty nicely. Now I can see that I have this cursor available here. I, can, um, I can't click on it just yet, but what I can do is now see vis visually that I have a UI for buying stuff. I should probably add a, a, a cost to it as well. So let me just go ahead and copy this, and we'll just say cost, and we'll say this is meaning a cost of 10. Let's say that will be 10 cookies, right? Or 10 cookies to make to buy a cursor. And we'll set this to minus 75. Does that work? Yep, cost 10. It looks kind of bad, so I'm going to shift this over to 40, 44. I'm just quickly doing um, ballpark numbers, magic numbers. Not, not good practice, but just for the sake of speed. Now, if I click on this, Nothing happens, but I do have an inventory, a, a, a UI now for where I can maybe start to buy the cookies or buy the cursors that will add to my passive cookie generation, my CPS, which we've coined. Um, Full-fledged computers still have their place, but I agree their days are numbered. Interesting, the text man. Um, little known fact, the app Swift Playgrounds on iPad contains the whole Swift library. Huh, fascinating. Um, I myself wouldn't mind a MacBook that has a touch screen. I think most of us here at CS50 have the same um, sort of wishes because it's such a nice uh, uh, quality of life improvement to be able to just click around uh, on the screen with your finger and do all that. But you know, Blackbeard0001, can you eat this cookie? Unfortunately, no. We, uh, we do not have that ability to do, to do that. Although I do find myself wanting right now some cookies. Um, I'm going to have to see if the office Ends up, uh, ends up having that, some of those around. I'm broke, dude, says Blackbeard0001. Uh, I think we can change that, though, right? Because if we click 10 cookies, what I want to have happen is the ability to be able to click on this cursor and then add a cursor you know, uh, showing that. Uh, uh, I want it somewhere on the screen to show me that I have one, two, three, four cursors in my inventory, so to speak, my passive, my infrastructure for which I'm going to generate passive cookies. We'll see what we can do. Uh, Tuxman, I'm, I'll speak to Tim Cook first thing on Monday. Awesome, you do that. You, you, you tell him um, what CS50 is looking for. Uh, OK, so we have this UI element here, but we can't actually add cursors to our inventory. So what we need to do is make that a possibility. Over in um, love.mousepressed, I can say if button is equal to one and let's say um, let's say hovering over cursor. Let's say let's say I want to write a function that does that, right? Then I can say cursors equals uh, let's say if cookies is greater than or equal to 10, then this is where the shop sort of transactional logic comes into play. Because remember, we're going to make the cursors worth 10 cookies, so I need to make sure that I have at least 10 cookies. So if cookies is less, greater than or equal to 10, then cookies is equal to cookies minus 10. And then we're going to say cursors, well rather we'll say table.insert you know, we don't even need to store, we don't even need to store cursors as a table. We're just gonna make this a number. So we're gonna say cursors is gonna be equal to cursors plus one. Right. So we're not even storing, we're not gonna have complicated objects or anything. We're just gonna have flat numbers at this point. This is gonna be a very numerical representation of cookie clicker. Um, we could get fancier with the graphics, but we're going to cut kind of more to the chase and just do um, just use numbers to represent that we have one cursor, two cursors, three cursors, uh, and so on. So let's go ahead and implement the hovering over cursor function. So that doesn't exist. We're going to need to do that ourselves. So hovering over cursor. And what we're going to do is essentially just say return that, uh, rather, we're going to say local 
x, y is equal to love.mouse.getPosition. I'm going to say x, uh, rather, return whether x is less than or equal to, and then where are we drawing the cursor? So we have, uh, we're getting, it looks like I got 50. So if it's less than or equal to 50 plus cursor texture get um, width, and x is uh, greater than or equal to 50, and y is less than or equal to, and what did we set it to? We set it to window height minus 90, is that what we did? Oh, rather, nope, sorry, this should be 64. And x is le uh, y is less than or equal to window height minus 120, and y is greater than or equal to um, window height minus 120 plus. Um, oh wait, rather less than or equal to that plus cursor texture get height. So a bit of a long Boolean expression here. Um, but that should end up working. Now, what I want to do is add some UI. I want to say love.graphics.print. At the very top left, we're going to say cursors, two string cursors. And we'll just make that at 0, 0 for now. And we'll see if this works. So let's, first of all, let's try to click on the cursors. Notice that I can't do it, right? Because I'm, I'm presuming because I don't have 10 cookies yet. But Let's, let's get 10 cookies, and let's try and add it. Oh, OK, interesting. So I do indeed have one cursor now, and my cookie count went back down to 0. So now I have the ability to buy cookies, or buy sort of infrastructure to generate cookies with, using cookies as currency. So this is great. This is a step in the right direction. The only problem is that the, these this infrastructure is not actually doing any work for us. We need to actually update this, these cookies over time, right? our cookie total. So what we can do is we'll say um, in love.update, um, let's see, where are we at? So it looks like it, it takes place in here. Normally, the cookie total gets updated within our mouse pressed, because that's where we're actually clicking on the uh, cookie to generate more cookies. But if we have things that are doing things over time for us, we probably want to just update it over time. So what I can do is I can say, um, uh, where'd be the best place to do this? Um, we'll do it in here, I guess. We'll say we'll say update cursors, and they'll pass it in delta time. So cursors is we're gonna sort of make sure that we don't uh, add too much uh, logic into our love.update function. And instead, we're going to create a subroutine called update cursors. We're going to delegate that to a different part of our code. We still want the DT, though, so we're going to pass that in to um, we're going to pass that into the uh, update cursors function. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to update a f uh, update cursors here, and now what we're actually going to need to do, which this is interesting. We're actually going to add whatever that cookie per uh, oh the cookie per second rate of the cursor is to our cookie total, but we'll see how this is a problem. So let's go ahead now. Let's let's assume that cursors are cursors generate one cookie every ten seconds, right? So every ten seconds, we should expect every cursor to add one cookie to our total. So what we're going to do is we're going to say um, for i is equal to 1 until cursors, right? And this is just from 1 to the number of cursors we have. Do this. I'm going to um, cookies is equal to cookies plus dt times. And then we want this to be however many cookies per second. And so this is going to be 0.1 cookies per second, right? Because we want one cookie every 10 seconds. So 0.1 cookies per second. So if we do this now, let's go ahead and run the application. 
I'm going to get 10 cookies. I'm going to add a cursor. And then notice that we don't exactly get the value that we want. I mean, granted, it's working. So once we get to after 10 seconds, you can see that we do have now one cookie that we had no part in. We did not generate this cookie ourselves. But the output is clearly uh, not the way that we want it to look. So the way to solve this very easily is where we actually render our cookie total. Uh, I'm going to just say toString math.floor of cookies. And then now, if I buy a cursor, I have one cursor. Cookies is staying at 0. But if we let 10 seconds pass by, we will indeed see that our cookie total goes up to 1 by itself. And any second now, we do indeed have one cookie. And completely based on just the cursor that we bought with our 10 cookie total. So things are improving a lot. What math.floor does is essentially takes a floating point value and will just cut off the floating point value and just give you the lowest integer closest to it. Um, the ceiling is the opposite, where it will actually give you the highest one. We don't want to give the ceiling, though, uh, because we want to only render that we have a cookie when we've completely generated that cookie. There are certain situations where you want to render a, an integer value um, that's rounded. Um, like for example, well, I can't think of an example offhand that's super obvious. I use floor a lot. But there are situations where you do want to render uh, uh, a, a more rounded number. And for that, you can just add 0.5 to a value and do math.floor. And that will give you the closest value to it. Um, that's effectively the same thing as just calling math.round. ASMR Gaming says, just build a feature that links this game to an Amazon Fresh API for cookies delivery if you want to eat them. Those are, those are the real ideas. That's, that's some real thinking going on right there. Um, I really want some cookies right now. This is a problem. Um, and I was actually watching Jacksepticeye. And while I was doing some research, I don't watch Jacksepticeye, but I, watched a, I was doing some research on Cookie Clicker last night just before I went into it so I wasn't completely blind watching him play it. And he was echoing the same exact sentiment. Yeah, he was very hungry for cookies while he was playing. And I, I, I can sympathize. I can empathize with that feeling now. I am starving for some cookies. So. We have an infrastructure in place now for cookie development, right? for cookie generation. This is great. This is awesome. Um, the next step, and to, to keep it in, in line with the actual cookie clicker game, is um, you can actually purchase grandmothers to bake you cookies for you over time. So let's, let's see if there's a grandmother sprite here, a grandma sprite. Something um, <laughs> not, not terribly, uh, this has got a. Uh, this one has a walker. I'm not sure if I, that's completely um, what I'm going for here. Let's say, um, let's, let's actually use Google Images. We'll say Grandma Sprite. This is OK. And it, it actually has a, a uh, rolling pin, so this is appropriate. Is this, a, is this an alpha sprite? No, it's not. Shoot. OK. Well, uh, yeah, it's going to be a problem. If it doesn't have alpha transparency, it's going to look a little bit um, sub ideal. This is the actual cookie clicker sprite itself, it looks like. That looks like a mermaid grandma. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what's going on with that. Um, is this one? Here we go. This one has, oh, this is actually a GIF. Oh, these are upgradable grandmas. I forgot. So, this is another aspect of the game. You can actually upgrade your grandmas to be, um, they go to farmers, then they go to engineers, then miners, then aliens, then aliens again, and then crazy aliens, and then I'm not sure what that is. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of steps here. Is there just a single um, sprite that we can get that is just the grandma? I'm hoping nothing super inappropriate comes up here either. You would not think that it would, but um, let's. Is this the? Oh, here we go. This. Ah, oh, it's a GIF again. That's fine. We'll use, oh, this is the right one. Oh, yeah, this is perfect. OK. Save image as. We're going to shrink this down because it's not the right size. So jharvard dev into cookie clicker, uh, rather, sorry, streams, cookie clicker, and then graphics, and then uh, grandma.png. Perfect. So this will be the next part. This will be the next important part. This stream is going to go for about 1.5 hours more, yes, yeah? is the true kines. Um, probably not this one. This one we might actually end at 3 today. We might make it a two-hour stream. Um, 
because this one's a, a bit of a simpler game and we could obviously keep going on and on with it, but the core gameplay loop I think we have kind of going on here pretty solidly. Um, and just because we also haven't had a very nice, concise, finished game stream in a while, so this one going for two hours I think is more appropriate, a bit of a faster pace today. Um, let's go ahead and first, first things first, very importantly, let's shrink this sprite down. So it's 134 by 208, not what we want. I'm going to go ahead and bring it into a sprite. Let's go ahead and first I'm going to crop it just so that it's completely edge to edge. I'm going to go to sprite, crop, and then let's go ahead and make this smaller. So I'm actually going to make the size, let's shrink it down by a factor of 4. So 134 divided by 4, if that's even a, okay, so that's not a thing. So let's, uh, 134 divided by 6. Nope, that's not a thing either. Let's just do it, um, let's do it by 2, I guess. So I'll actually make this 60, we'll make this 66. Let's see what that looks like. Looks great, looks fine. Um, let's zoom in a little bit. Let's recrop. We can afford to zoom in one more time, it looks like. So let's zoom in at 30, let's zoom this in at 32. So that looks great, let's crop it. Let's save it. Let's go ahead and import it into our game. Love.graphics.newImage, graphics slash grandma.png. And then let's go ahead and draw it just for the sake of drawing, uh, for, for seeing that the UI looks appropriate. And in fact, this we could probably delegate to a subroutine called draw, um, draw cursor UI, draw grandma UI, etc. We could do all of that. I'm actually just going to copy and paste this. And then I'm going to, and this is not typically what you want to do. You typically want to do this more programmatically. But just to illustrate everything, this is what we're going to, what we're going to do. We're going to draw this at 128. And we'll say grandma cost. And the cost for a grandma is going to be 100 cookies. And what this is going to do is one grandma will let you uh, generate one cookie per second. So let's go ahead and um, this is going to be at, let's say this is at 116 and then 108. And then a cost for that is going to be 100. And then we need grandmas. And then this was actually, we're going to actually need to draw this at 0, 0.32 or 33. And then now let's also, okay, let's try that. Okay, it needs to be shifted over a bit more. And the sprite is actually a little too tall, so I need to make that higher. So let's shift that over a bit more. So I'm actually going to bring this over to um, 148, 132, 120. And let's bring the grandma texture up to negative 132. Let's try that. OK, looks pretty good. Let's shift the cost over just a little bit because that looks like it needs to be at like maybe 130. Let's do a 132. Okay, so that looks great. Let's go ahead now. We need to actually, uh, hovering over grandma, we need another function. And, you know, you would ideally implement, you would, you would engineer this in a more robust way where you would have click handlers on the individual images, you would have objects to represent them, UI elements, and so on and so forth. But just to get us, uh, you know, up and running, this is, I think, a little bit easier. So if x is less than or equal to, and then we decided that was 148, plus uh, grandma texture get width, and x is greater than or equal to 148, and then this is window height minus 132, cursor, uh, and then this would be grandma texture get height, and then minus 132. And then additionally, up here in our update, we can say if button is equal to 1 and hovering over grandma, 
Then if cookies over 100, cookies is equal to cookies minus 100, and grandma's is equal to grandma's plus 1. So this is good. We're, we're, we're working our way up. Let's say grandma's generate one cookie every second. So 10 times more effective than the, uh, than the cursor and also 10 times more expensive. So everything kind of linearly maps in that case. Local grandma's equal to 0. So do I have grandma's equal to grandma's? Yes, I do. So we can test that this works. Um, oh, we need update grandma's as well. So we can do that. We'll just duplicate this. Update grandma's. We'll say for one until grandma's do grand cookies is equal to cookies plus delta time. Now it's not 0.1, it's just one, because we do one every second. Recall that delta time gives us a time in fractions since seconds so that we can get um, sort of how much um, how much of one cookie we've generated maps evenly to delta time because we are getting it delta time as a fraction of one second. So by scaling it times one, that's exactly how many one uh, one cookie per second cookies we've generated effectively. So we can go over here to, uh, let's make sure that we're actually calling update grandmas. Run, the, run this uh, bit of code. Let's click. Let's actually be smart about this. Let's generate some cursors. Help us get our rate up a little bit. Oh, interesting. So cursors and grandmas are both incrementing, um, which is not ideal. And actually, the uh, it looks like cookies are getting generated a little slowly. Oh, wait, no, that's actually accurate. Those are our, um, wait, no, that's not the case, is it? Yeah, no, it's, no it's, that's, that's accurate. Grandma's for some reason is getting, oh, you know why? Because we copied and pasted the UI code. That's my, that's my fault. What we need to do is we need to say grandma's to string grandma's here. So the, the cursors were generating appropriately. OK, this is by a cursor. Now that's appropriate. OK, let's go ahead and do that. Now let's go ahead and let's just get a crap ton of cookies and buy one grandma and see how much faster our rate goes. And again. The um, cookies, the cursor and grandma rates not being applied to our CPS, we can add that here in just a second so everything gets tied together. I'm going to buy a grandma, and now notice that we are indeed getting one cookie every second and a little more because we have two cursors. So we're actually getting sort of 1.2 cookies per second in this particular, um, in this particular situation. Um, cool. Let's go ahead and if we're, if we're going to make our CPS accurate, what we need to do is we need to say cookies this second equals cookies this second, um, or rather. This kind of gets a little complicated, actually. Um, oh, is this actually not even, is this, does this work already because cookies, oh, you know what? Um, Cookies this second is not going to work because cookies this second only gets applied when we physically click the um, when we physically click the mouse. That's actually causing the cookie to increment. So, um, hmm. Let's see, how best to do this? So we could just do a flat. Oh, you know what we could do? This actually simplifies it quite a bit. This is, this is, this is quite a bit simpler. In, um, in, Okay, 
So what we do is we say passive, we, ha we have to have a passive cookies per second thing. And this is actually an efficiency thing that we can take into consideration. So I can say um, local passive cookies is equal to 0. This will be our rate of generation for all of our passive cookies. And actually, I just realized that by using the passive cookie gen, we can pre-calculate our passive cookie gen and then just apply it uh, in update and not actually need all these separate subroutines. So this is actually quite a bit easier. Um, Oh, Blackbeard001, happy birthday, man. If this is your birthday and my birthday, nobody calls me, even my mom, everybody forgets me. I'm sorry, Blackbeard. That's, that's very sorry. To, I'm, I'm sad to hear that. Uh, well, happy birthday. Happy belated birthday to you. And thank you for wishing me a happy birthday. I, I appreciate it. Uh, Anata Vision, I love that emoji, the cookie, the, the bite out of the Kappa face. That's amazing. Um, can you, wait, what was it? Uh, where's my mouse? There it is. Can you collaborate with Toby eye tracking? If you blink an eye, that grandma going to put poison in the cookie and game over? Uh, <laughs> I'm sure you probably could, but I'm not 100% sure if, um, if you'd want to do something like that. Told you you can't trust grandma. <laughs> that's, that's funny. Um, Bavik, thank you for the, uh, for, the, um, for the assistance there. Yeah, copy pasting is generally bad for that exact reason. You Im you copy and paste bugs as a result. Just saw on YouTube that it's episode forty two, meaning the universe for Colton's birthday outfitting. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's all it all sort of comes around and and shows its true nature, doesn't it? Um, I'm gonna forget about them when I become a billionaire. This is Blackbeard. <laughs> true. That's a good way to look at it. I I respect it. Okay, so what we can do is passive cookies equals zero. Every frame, um, basically we can figure out our passive cookie gen. And I'm going to go to um, we'll say This is an update, probably, right? If the second timer is greater than or equal to 1, where we set cookies, um, where I set our CPS, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to add, um, I'm going to add passive cookies plus the cookies last second plus cookies this second divided by 2. And what this is going to end up doing is we'll still manually keep track of our clicks, but the passive cookie generation is going to be, um, the passive cookie generation is going to be where we store all of the cursors and grandmas and all that stuff. So we don't even need to worry about figuring that out frame by frame. We can just simply add that every time we buy a, um, grandma or a cursor, all we need to do is just set passive cookies plus equals passive cookies plus 0 0.1 for the cursor. And then passive cookies equals passive cookies plus 1 for when we hover over grandma, when we, when we click on a grandma. So this is sort of like not doing a frame by frame calculation of stuff. It's a little more efficient. We're actually just doing it up front. So this actually saves us work. Um, and Asachi, Rocket Swing 5, Blackbeard, uh, thank you all very much for the follows. I appreciate it. I might have gotten Blackbeard if I did, and I apologize, but thank you very much. And so the CPS now is going to be a, a little more accurate um, because cookies this second, we can actually, um, well, cookies this second still needs to get uh, updated so that we can figure out um, Is that the case, though? Actually? Um, what we can do here is we can just say function update passive cookies. And we'll just say cookies equals cookies plus cookie or uh, plus passive cookies times delta time. So 
now, instead of needing to go through all the curses, all the grandmas, et cetera, we just have this constant value that we're multiplying times delta time to give us our, our cookies. So it's a little more efficient, actually. Um, now, the issue is that um, we need to keep track of how many cookies we generated this frame. So cookies, this frame is equal to, or rather, we'll say local cookies last frame is equal to um, cookies. And then we'll say local cookies after frame is going to be equal to cookies. And then we'll say um, we'll say local new cookies equals um, math.floor of cookies after frame minus the math.floor of the cookies last frame. And this means that if we've gone from like 10 cookies to 11 cookies, there'll be a one cookie difference. And what we can do is we can just say cookies equals cookies plus, or we, rather, we can say um, cookies this frame, second rather, equals cookies this second plus new cookies. So this is cool. So this is how we can actually calculate our CPS a little bit more um, a little bit more dynamically. So that should be that should be accurate. So now, oh whoops, update cursors, main three eight, main eighty two. We no longer have update cursors, update grandmas, we have update passive cookies, which takes in delta time. So we've refactored the, that all to something. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just do that. Let's buy a cursor. I'll buy a grandma as well, just so we can see our CPS update appropriately, even if we uh, aren't clicking on anything. So I'm going to buy a grandma. Nice. So we are indeed getting one cookie per second. And occasionally, we'll get two, I think. Yeah, so 1.5. Two, roughly. So we have about one. It's getting um, it's getting calculated dynamically in this case. We could pre-calculate all of this with the passive cookie generation, and then use that value, and that would be a little bit more efficient, possibly. Um, that way, we wouldn't have to recalculate this every frame, and then just only calculate the difference in when we click cookies. Maybe add that to the passive gen of some kind. But you can see that we have um, a, a CPS value that gets updated appropriately. I'm going to buy another grandma. So now, now we have about two cookies per frame, cookies per second, I should say. And you can keep extending this, this idea outwards more and more. You could buy, a, buy nine more cursors. Sure, I'll buy nine more cursors. Cool, so now we have approximately three cookies per second. We are, uh, we have ex actually, we should have exactly three cookies per second. So this is cool, right? We have uh, the ability now to, this framework, this exact framework is all you need in order to essentially implement cursors, grandmas, mines, factories, farms, whatever the, the actual game ends up giving you the ability to do. Um, and you'll have this CPS value here. All you essentially need for every individual machine that you um, that you uh, add to your game, whether it's a farm, whether it's a mine or whatever, is just have the number of um, cookies per second, which is this constant value that you just multiply um, by delta time every frame. You just add it to a total, a constant total, and then just multiply that by dt. Because the dt is a sort of a, a fractional amount of time in seconds, so by applying it to this, after a second, you'll have generated that much, um, that many cookies, right? So after 0.1 seconds, you'll have generated, or after one second, you'll have generated 0.1 cookies with a cursor. After a second, you'll have generated one cookie with a grandma. If this were this value were 10, then you could generate 10 cookies per second. Um, it's all calculated frame by frame, so you do get a continuous increasing number. It's not like you get 10 flat cookies after 10 seconds. It's a, it's a value that's increasing. It's a rate of change um, rather than a discrete sort of chunk um, allocation of cookies. And uh, Raccoonberry says, hey, hello, Raccoonberry. Good to have you in methodology. Did by the Nightmare Cursors just for you. Um, that 
I mean, I think that honestly does it for Cookie Clicker. This will be a shorter stream today, I think, um, just because we've it's been a little while, it feels like, since we've had a, a game start to finish that we've um, sort of implemented and gotten working. The uh, Solitaire game is still in, in progress, and that we're going to implement next week. That will be, um, uh, well, probably the week after next, to be honest. We have other streams going on next week, more details to come on those. Um, I've just ended up finishing talking with Nick, who I th think can do a stream on Monday. And it's been a while since we've seen Nick, right? It's been, let's see. Um, yeah, so next Monday, uh, I just got the word from him that we're set for a Monday stream, so we're going to publish all, uh, publicize all of that today. Um, let's go ahead and publish this to GitHub, actually, which we should do. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and create a terminal. Let's go ahead, cd dev streams. Um, uh, let's see, this is going to be cookie, cookie clicker. And I'm going to just do the infamous git add dot, uh, rather git init, and then git add dot, git commit, everything, um, final, uh, final stream status. Oh, whoops. It actually create the repo. Let's do that first. Oh, yeah, true, Kinesis. Um, I still have to figure out why the schedule is weird for certain people. It's a widget in Twitch that might have a bug, um, but we'll see what we can do about that. I apologize that that's rendering weirdly for some people abroad. I think for US folks, it seems to be OK, but for people that are international, I think it's having some issues. Um, if you have any questions, by the way, on uh, what we did so far, Definitely let me know as we're getting this GitHub uh, repo up and running and as we close off the last um, sort of five to ten minutes here. Typically, my streams don't go for, my, they go for three hours. Today went for two hours, so it's sizable, um, but still not as long as usual. Today we did a simpler game, um, but it was cool. Thanks, mate. Nice stream. This was my first time watching Seas 50. It's so fun to watch and inspiring. Thank you. Awesome, Blackbeard. Appreciate it. Thanks so much for tuning in. Glad you enjoyed. Um, I like the flow of today's stream. It felt like we accomplished a lot in a short period of time, especially after Solitaire, where it's a bit more hands-on, more engineering considerations, more complicated algorithms. That's a bit, um, it's nice to sort of take a step back and do the simpler stuff, right? We have a text adventure stream coming up in the next few weeks. That will be pretty cool. Maybe have Brian or Dave or Brian, David or Brian code review your code. Hey, to be fair, I am not going for, um, good code style in this exact example. Uh, if we were going for, for well-engineered code, we would, um, we would uh, probably be taking our time with a lot more and modularizing things. Um, but yeah, that'd be, a, that'd be a funny stream in any case. Uh, oh, shoot, interesting. As he says that uh, Irene, Andre, and Bella have a surprise present for me, collaborating on a game. Interesting. The Labyrinth of Colton. Oh, we're gonna have to do it on. We're gonna have to do that on stream now. Um, so we'll see. Worked with Godot. If so, is it worth it? Uh, I have not worked with it personally. I tried installing it. I think once and briefly looked at the documentation. Haven't um, haven't done much with it concretely. So let me go ahead and get this on GitHub for everybody. Pub the link, and then uh, we'll explore the Labyrinth of Colton together on stream. Hopefully, it's a. Uh, Hopefully it's PG-13 at least, fingers crossed. We'll see, uh, we'll see how things are. I have no idea what to expect. Cookie clicker stream on twitch.tv slash csvtv. Make it public, create repo. Um, let's go ahead, get this URL, go over here. Let's get remote at origin, to that origin. Let's get push upstream origin master. And let's refresh to make sure it's up, which it is. Uh, I have my DS store in there. I'm not even going to bother with the uh, git ignore. So uh, let's go ahead. I'm going to copy. I'm going to write this in the chat so folks can download it if they feel like it. Coltonoscopy. Whoops, that is not how you spell that. Coltonoscopy slash cookie clicker stream. I think that's right. Adam Antine, check the game, Colton. Not safe for work. Colton, do check it. They worked very hard. Can we confirm whether it's actually not safe for work, or is Adam trolling?
Oh boy, is it actually not safe for work? Oh, uh, I can, I can, uh, <laughs> I can bring my, here, I'll look at it on this other computer where, where there's not, uh, I kind of want my first impressions on camera though. I don't want to click on it on another, on another stream. Okay, so Adam is kidding. Okay, cool. I appreciate the, I appreciate the joke. Uh, you know, he is trolling. <laughs> okay, so we'll pull it up. I'm going to pull it up on um, on my computer here, but I need a, a link to it. That is a long URL. Okay, so that is Irene Andre Asley uh, Bella.itch.io slash the labyrinth of Colton. Is this correct? Andre Asley Bella.itch.io slash the labyrinth of Colton. All right, here we go. We're going to run this game. Let me get rid of this. Uh, it's a little bit small here. Let me, do a, let me do us all a favor briefly. I'm going to set my display settings a little bit differently. I'm going to go to displays, 1080p. Let's give that just a second. It's going to blow up. Let me go back to my editor here. Let me shrink this down just a touch. Just a touch. Okay, let's zoom that in just like that. All right, we have a community game themed around apparently me that we're going to test on stream right now. Let's see how this looks. Uh, it's extremely safe. So today's chat was really fun, says so Cyril. Awesome. Glad that you think so. Oh wow, everything looks so tiny now compared to uh, compared to how it was before. Let's go ahead and run our game. Let's see what this looks like. Let me zoom in actually once, twice. And let's see, are there instructions? No. Run the game. Oh, it's Unity. Here we go. OK, nice. So a little fun, a little game programming, and now a little fun to end the stream. See how this looks? Birthday Project is the name of it. Nice. Unity WebGL. Appreciate it. Cool. Made with Unity. Here we go. Oh, man. Here we go. OK, so we're using the, uh, we're using the third person controller, I see, in, in Unity. OK. So actually it actually runs pretty smoothly. Wow, look at that. That's nice. OK, let's, uh, let's go ahead and, and walk. OK, so we are limited to walking. There's no, it looks like there's no running, per se. Oh, you can run with shift. OK, let's collect the gems. Here we go. <laughs> it's an interesting uh, sort of like de gravity-defying effect there. OK, so is my goal to collect all the gems then, I'm guessing? I do like the particle effects that, uh, that we've implemented here. OK, so let's go forward. OK. Now, there are, the, the unfortunate thing is I'm using a trackpad to actually maneuver around this. So it's a little, little bit iffy with the camera. But that's not anyone's fault but me for not having a, not having a uh, mouse. OK. All right, here we go. Some more gems. I think I missed this before. This is where I came from. Let's get these. Wow, trackpads are so hard to use with, uh, with uh, for, uh, third person and first person, which just with camera controls, period. Uh, trackpads are pretty terrible. OK. Not, not, uh, not your guys' fault, obviously. This is, this is just a function of how trackpads are just really not meant for gaming. Um, OK. So we have a statue here. It's uh, what kind of statue is It looks like it's just pointing. So obviously, go this direction. OK. Got a bunch of, bunch of gems. So I'm going to be rich here. Let's get all of these. Um, I, I want to get my cursor back to the right side here. Okay. I feel like such a noob uh, playing with the trackpad and just struggling to use my camera. Um, but no, this runs very nicely. I like the uh, I like the maze layout. I'm proud of you guys for uh, putting together a Unity project. Let's see. Okay, so go this way. Let's look to the left. OK, make sure I got all the gems. I'm a very completionist sort of player, so I don't like missing any gems or any, anything in, in the game at all, period. So if I, if I miss something, I have kind of an OCD about it. All right, let's go over here. Ugh, man, trackpads are so rough. OK, here we go. Getting all the gems. 
there might be a ton of secrets in here that I'm just missing. So I apologize. Oh, I like the I like the sort of layered gems here. Okay, nice. You know, this isn't a very difficult labyrinth to solve if you're pointing in, in the direction for me to go. I will say, but uh, I do appreciate it. Oh, there we go. Two at a time. That's what I'm talking about. There we go. Okay. Let's get that. Boom, boom. Uh, let's come over this way. I, I, because you're not pointing in this direction, I want to go over and see what's in here because I feel like this is where there's probably some secrets or something. So let's see what, let's see what we got over here. Um, more gems, of course. Now, do I have a gem counter that I can see? Or is there any, is it just kind of a hidden value? Oh, is there a sound? Shoot. OK, I didn't realize there was sound. OK, let's try that. Can you all hear sound? Confirm, confirm that you can hear sound. It's looking like it might be a little loud. Is that right? How, how's the volume? Is that too loud, too quiet? I actually can't hear it in house here because we don't have a, a monitor. But that's actually a good thing because if we had a monitor playing the sound back to you and you were hearing it through my microphone, you'd probably get we'd probably get some feedback. So let's avoid doing that actually. Um, oh shoot! I think I now now is where I want to see some of those statues. I think I got lost. Uh, okay, let's go over here. Um, okay, this looks like we're in the right spot. Okay, this is the right spot. All right, I'm gonna go in here. I'm gonna follow the statue. That's so cool. That's so cool. I, I didn't even hear that before. It's a, there's a audio. I'm going to be so upset if that was meant to be like a song and I have, I've just missed the song this whole time. Was that, is that meant to be a song or is that meant to be a, or is that meant to be a, uh, just kind of like a, a set of random nice tones? Oh boy, here we go. Okay. Oh, I can't. Oh, it, you, you disabled running here. This is cool. That was that was amazing. That was beautiful. Wow. I'm so glad that you told me to uh, that you told me to turn the sound on at the end there. Oh shoot! What's this? Oh wow. This is so cool. Oh man, this is this is oh this is too much. You guys are too much. Wow, I love it. I like the the nice lighting too. I I'm, I'm, I will say the night the lighting on the ground there is very nice. Really sells that we're in a uh, sort of a uh, like a laminated floorboard type deal. Click on the switch. Okay, let's click on the switch. Is this a switch right here? Let's see. Click on the switch. <laughs> wow, you guys went all out. Holy crap. be honest this is so amazing what's over there in the distance is that uh is that maybe harvard university or something i can't necessarily tell it looks kind of like harvard i see some of the buildings look like harvard wow this is... <laughs> oh man You guys, you guys went above and beyond and overdid yourselves on this one. This is amazing. Thank you all so much for putting this together. That was uh, very touching, honestly. This is this is great, and it's it's it looks really nice too. All these particle effects look very great. The lighting looks good. It runs super nicely in WebGL. Oh, can blow the candles too? Really? How do we do that? Let's see. 
says the notes were all done around the happy birthday to you by the way but the rest are played randomly got it so that's that's probably a uh, a good thing or a um, yeah I guess a good thing because I was kind of getting the, the, the gem sort of in the wrong place excellent design by the way enforcing the need to walk slowly in order to get all of the birthday notes to play them at the right speed um, apologies if the, <laughs> the audio was a bit too loud uh, I, can, I can mute the tab. Um, but what I was saying was that the, uh, like the design decision, the UI decision to enforce that the user walks, you know, sort of slowly to play the song, I thought that was great, very well orchestrated. There was a great buildup, um, you know, navigating a maze, sort of having the statues point. Uh, I didn't see it coming. Um, it, it was beautiful. Honestly, it was a beautiful, beautiful uh, project. And even though it doesn't look necessarily like to. Um, uh, whose point was that? Andre's point that the graphics were much better in Windows and Mac. Um, uh, the builds, I mean, even still, the fact that it's running in the web browser and still runs at like 60 frames per, uh, per second, um, it was great. It was fantastic. But no, this was, this was amazing. Uh, really, really enjoyed this project and seeing it. And uh, very proud of all of you for putting it together. Um, you all have been tuning into this um, stream for a long time. We're, this is the 42nd episode that we've produced, right? And we've covered a bit of Unity and game programming. And um, I know that many folks tuning into the stream don't have a ton of experience. But by doing things like this periodically, um, consistently, this is how you can achieve really amazing things with the technology that we have. Um, and it's very nice to see concrete implementations of that. And you, know, you folks went above and beyond for this. That was great. Thank you so much. Uh, I really do appreciate this very much. Um, an amazing end to uh, an amazingly satisfying stream as well. Um, great note to end on. Really, really like it. And yeah, this is the 42nd. Yep. Uh, sort of the meaning of life stream, as it were, to quote uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Which I haven't read yet, but David uh, has told me that I should read it at some point. Yeah, this is great. Uh, was a little bit lost that 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 the birthday corridor, and then going into here, and then having this the the soundtrack to the stream that we hear all the time on Twitch. Uh, really, really cool, really meaningful stuff. Um, really well put together project. That. Uh, I will remember this for a long time. So thank you all very much for being so thoughtful and putting this together. And uh, I'm glad, so glad, that we had the opportunity to share it on stream and do it blind and live so that everybody could sort of see the reaction. So this is amazing. And uh, here's to many more streams in the future, right? This is number 42, but we have another one on Friday, right? On Friday, we're going to have a JavaScript stream. So tune in for that. The soundtrack was Az's idea. It was an excellent idea. It really, really hit home at that point. Um, and the happy birthday thing was um, still, still amazing. Like, 
like a, you know, goosebump inducing, right? Um, yeah, Friday we're we're taking a break away from from games again. We're doing web, so we've done CSS and HTML and even Bootstrap. On uh, on Friday we'll do some basic JavaScript. We'll do we'll cover the syntax, we'll cover arrays and objects and functions and all that stuff. Make some simple code. Um, talk about the console using the Chrome Developer Tools. Integrate into a web page. Do some basic stuff. We'll use the we'll do DOM manipulation uh, using document and window. Um, so basic things like alert. Then we'll even look at Bootstrap and see how we can import Bootstrap and get some um, dynamic Bootstrap behavior that way. So that'll be a lot of fun. I'm also looking very much forward to it. Um, but in the meantime, tomorrow there's no stream. So take a break tomorrow. Um, take the time to work on your own projects, perhaps, or do whatever makes you happy. Uh, but Friday, JavaScript, and then next week, uh, I just got the word from Nick now during the stream that on Monday we'll have a, our official cryptocurrency stream. So we had a, a technical difficulty stream when we were supposed to have a crypto stream. Uh, on Monday, we we're going to actually do our proper crypto stream, our proper two hours uh, of talking about Bitcoin and blockchain and all kinds of other fun stuff. Um, it's going to be good. It's going to be a good time. And that will be that I think sort of tie that knot, and then we can do more streams with Nick in the weeks um, sort of follow that. Bella Kirst is glad you enjoyed it. Thank you for all the amazing streams. Have a wonderful, happy birthday! Thanks so much, Bella, for tuning in so religiously and for putting together such an amazing project. I really do appreciate it. I'm looking forward to many more to come. And Adam says hi for the JS stream, but his own projects are not safe for work. I'll have to keep that in mind if you ever decide to share some of your projects with me. Um, going ahead and make sure not to look at them live on stream. Raccoonberry asks, are uh, any prior pr uh, JavaScript knowledge needed for Friday? Uh, I would say no. I would say we're going to start from pretty much the ground up, and we'll talk about the basics of JavaScript. I would say it helps if you have prior programming experience in Python or C or Java, whatever, because we will be um, not going like you know granular by like here is a curly bracket or whatnot. We'll, we'll sort of cover things assuming that you have a little bit of programming experience. But you don't necessarily need to have any JavaScript knowledge per se. And at any, thank you very much. Um, thank you for the brilliant streams. Have lots of fun. Thank you for tuning in so much at any and for um, also contributing to that project. Um, all of you did such an awesome job. And all of you who tune in on a regular basis make this fun. So we'll do a lot more in the future. I'm going to transition away sort of begrudgingly from the happy birthday Colton screen because I do like it. I do like to see that um, over here. To the to the large shot, uh, so thank. <laughs> Adam says I'm NSFW. NSFW. Uh, we'll make sure not to uh, not to show any of your content on stream, then Adam. But so thank. But thank you for the heads up. I appreciate it. No, but I'm sure you're probably kidding. Um, Bavik says thank you. Have a great day. Enjoy the day. See you on Friday. Indeed. Thank you very much. See you on Friday. And Andre, thank you very much. Uh, always having a lot of fun with the stream. So glad you enjoyed this. Uh, yeah. No, it was tremendous. Thank you all. Thank you all so much for it. Really was beautiful. Um, I think this is, will be where we conclude uh, Cookie Clicker. So we implemented the whole thing, right? All set to go. Now, if you wanted to make this like the actual game, there's a lot of other graphical bits and pieces. But you can obviously do this yourself. You can extend what we've done. You can make it look prettier. We didn't make our game look terribly pretty. But you could certainly do this. And I would say take the code base that we looked at today, extend it, add your own little cookie generation facilities, Maybe add a different UI for your different infrastructure that you've created. Make a web-based version. Now you know how it works. You can certainly add a web-based version, which, um, which is how the original cookie clicker is itself implemented. right? And you could even do something with databases where you store a user's cookies amount and the different infrastructure they've built up so they can reload. Or you could store it as a session or something or store it in local storage. There's a lot of different ways you can do it. So, um, and thank you all to who have just followed recently. I know that um, it looked like Anesthesia One was the name. Altanesia, sorry. Altanesia, Alsachi, Rocket Swing. Thank you very much for the follows. Much appreciated. Um, yeah. Thank you all so much again. This was CS50 on Twitch, Cookie Clicker, and an amazing happy birthday Unity project, which they plugged in the chat. Go visit that if you yourself want to play it. Thanks again so much to all who contributed to that. I really do appreciate it. I will see all of you on Friday. Until then, have a great Wednesday. Have a great uh, Thursday. And see you on Friday for some JavaScript. Bye-bye. <laughs>